Welcome to Biggest Geekus. We are your hosts. I am Joe. I'm Randy. This is episode 55 of our podcast, and the date is Wednesday, September 29th, 2021. How's it going? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Got out to a sweet little bicycle ride today. Mm. About 20 miles, a little less, actually. So but it was good. It was good. I'd lost five, uh, three pounds last week. All Dying. right. It's happening, baby. Three pounds. Three pounds. Well, I'm down. I'm down twenty three since last off time. Your, I did off your earlobe, one of your earlobes. Yeah, yeah, I just fell right off. It was pretty sweet. Yeah. So, I'm hoping uh, keeping the. I'm trying the intermittent fasting still. It's working out. My, my stomach is adjusting to it. So, not as hungry as I was a few weeks ago. That's good. It's good. Still fat, but not as fat. <laughs> twenty something pounds lighter. <laughs> cool. So, cheater. Hey, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> Go ahead. We're going to get to that. Mm-hmm. I'm in charge here. You oh, are. My bad. You are in the co pilot seat. Shut up. I'm not good at the co pilot seat. You know that. Yeah, you are not. I'll shut my hole. So we had some, we had some call ins. We had some email. One of our stories needs to be attributed to Mr. Josh. Mm. Um, I believe it is the, I'm trying to find it here. Um, the next edition of D&D announced. I know he sent that one to me. Yeah, he sent it to us. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, thank you, Josh, for the news item. We will be reading that, or we'll be talking about that when it comes up to it. I didn't get a chance to read the article. I've I know been, it. I've been a busy boy. Perfectly. I know it perfectly. <laughs> By heart, can you recite it? No. Then you don't know it perfectly. I do. I perfectly know well enough to lie to Joe and tell him whatever I want. Whatever I want him to know, he'll know about yes. six. All right. So um programming note, we are going to be switching to Tuesdays starting next week. Uh for the near future. I don't know if we're gonna stay there or we'll not. See. We'll see. Experimental. Yeah. And we may be. If, yes, fingers crossed. Randy's is crossing his fingers um, in front of his camera. Um, for the listeners out there, not the watchers, because <laughs> the can watchers. Hear me cross my fingers. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, we were going to be experimenting with Streamyard starting hopefully next week if we can work any bugs out uh, in between then and now. If not, we'll do another just recorded podcast, not live. Um, but starting next week, hopefully, we will start we'll start streaming live via StreamYard. Cool. Um, not sure precisely what we're going to stream to, but the easiest ones are Twitch. We can't do YouTube yet. And um, we need 1,000 subscribers. Oh, it's a long way. To stream, to stream live on YouTube. But there's, a, there's Twitch, and then there's a couple other places, maybe Facebook um and odyssey and we'll see what we'll see what we come up with by next tuesday we will announce something at some point what we might do though randy is um i'm just thinking about this instead of springing the live stream on everybody at the same time right all of a sudden what we should do is do our normal thing okay and then when we are comfortable we will announce that the following week uh that way people will get the word because we only were since we're only weekly yeah yeah we'll work the bugs out first so maybe a week or two but we're yeah. thinking about streaming streaming is definitely in our window of, live yes we don't have blinders on we're slowly thinking about cool things like that yes all right speaking of cool things we got some call-ins oh yeah cool and for us to hear, all of us to hear the call-ins, we have to share. Yes. Share, Joseph. He doesn't like to share. No. I'm a greedy capitalist. Yes. At least that's the rumor. Rumor. All right. Starting with Jason. All right. Our man. Here's a hot take for you. Marines are just naval infantry. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 
I don't know if we have any Navy guys out there, but uh, <laughs> listening. Got, I got family, and we got friends here that are Navy. Yeah, we got they don't. Uh, Marines and Army. You're Army. So. I'm Army, but do they listen? No. Okay. Does. If any of you <laughs> Navy folks out there are listening, that are listening, are in the Navy or were in the Navy, mm -hmm. um, you can respond to that. That would be interesting. I have, I have no comment. I did not serve, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in um, training, and uh, there was a uh, Navy, former Navy, moved into the Army um, and was in training at the same time. Hmm. Um, we were in our school training, uh, medic training, and he had the funniest way of marching. <laughs> really? His very first, whenever we start, when you start the march, you don't do anything special. You just start walking. Right. And he did this. He just stuck his foot way out there. You know, it was very, it was kind of dramatic. I mean, it probably wasn't as dramatic as I remember, but compared to what you normally do, it was like he was a spaz or something. I don't know. Are those Navy guys squirrely? Is that what it is? Well, that one was. <laughs> that dude was. All right. All right. <laughs> the insidious thing about the people that buy into these Reddit trolls like the OK symbol, which, as you rightly point out, was just the OK symbol, like, all right, we're OK, up until the fact somebody made a joke and, and then it, you know, spiraled out, is people in real life, real people lost jobs over the OK symbol. Real people have received real punishments, like in the military. Real people have received real, legit USMC, UCMJ punishments over the OK symbol. So these things spiral out of control, and these internet jokes end up actually ruining people's lives. You know, cops have lost jobs over the OK symbol. So th that's the danger here. It, you know, as opposed to it just being a joke, it, it becomes dangerous. We live in crazy times. That's so weird. We're in crazy world. You can't tell jokes anymore. And people just lose their mind. I mean, that's that's a sad, sad state of affairs. That tells us more about the folks just blindly following whatever uh, the folks in the military that would uh, charge somebody under the UCMJ. Right. Because they made the OK symbol. <laughs> they're the problem not the jokesters i mean people are going to joke all over the place um, no the jokes we, we should be there. able to take a joke and have a thick skin but apparently even in the military you have some some of them bowing to this um idea that they should be able to do something like that i guess or an okay symbol and if it's on the internet, a, it must be true right right Right. And that's well, a, the internet that, thing is neither here nor there. It's the the crowd of people who took that uh, and ran with it. I mean, the joke was small. Yes. The people that really made it bad weren't the people who initially joked. It was the uh, social justice cancel culture crew who took that and said, oh, I can't believe it. And well, that's yeah. Then the then it got picked up by people outside of the internet, um, whatever community, uh, yeah. to to also pick up on somehow the symbol that they've always used, always known was a particular thing, and let themselves be led into thinking yep. it's something else. Yeah, and then acting on that in the military. I mean, I, I would say I would put the blame on two people. The the sort that got their panties in a wad about the okay joke or whatever or it being a being a symbol of notch because it's a buzzword oh it's nazi it's a nazi symbol and people go nuts just by seeing that it's like why don't you stop and take what happened to and like i get it i can get you can pull the wool over my eyes i'm not difficult to trick but usually when i get when something sounds a little bit weird you at least say you gotta be kidding dude right that can't be right that can't be right at mm -hmm. least ask yeah. that question Right. I mean, it's not like folks were saying it's always been a white supremacy symbol. What right. they were saying is that the alt-right had co-opted it 
and now folks who used it um was a dog whistle for white supremacy so there was some nuance there but also also crap yeah nuance made from gigantic assumptions of pure stupidity which are completely unproven prove yeah. the alt-right took it yeah. prove it yeah. show yeah. all their massive no oh, massive also, uh, also protests. even not considering that um let's say a lot of people in the alt-right used it as some sort of thing right just because i use it doesn't make that so <laughs> no i mean if every if every alt-right individual wanted to wear a blue t-shirt for some reason yeah does that sim so suddenly make the blue t-shirt um you know you can't you you can't wear that anymore yeah, you can't wear a blue t-shirt alt -right. alt right wears blue t-shirts yeah it's it's stupidity yeah. yeah on many levels yeah so the blame belongs with the administers of whatever so-called justice they thought they were doing right Oh, you skipped one. I haven't read that article. You're I did. Yep. It's like there was a thing last year or maybe in the past year or so with Boogaloo. That's it. The and these these folks that, according to the Internet, were all white supremacist, crazy, anti-government revolutionaries, right? Separatists that would wear Hawaiian shirts and be armed to the teeth and and it became the boogaloo thing. And and it makes it so, depending where you work and what you do, you get, you know, second looks when you're wearing that Hawaiian shirt that you've been wearing, or, you know, if you're wearing Hawaiian shirts the last decade or the past 30 years, and now all of a sudden, you, you know, you have to be careful not to wear that shirt around certain people, or, or you get unfair accusations, then you have to legitimately defend your job against. So I, I don't know what how to fight cancel culture easily, for the average person so i i don't know well it's an uphill battle for most no notice jason he had the example for us we just waited and listened he used the blue shirt he used the hawaiian shirt but how how do to me I mean, i'm a nobody when it comes to pretty much anything i'm just a math teacher at community college but if 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 i were Somehow, you know, if I wore the Hawaiian shirt or I use the OK symbol and I pissed off the wrong person and for some reason they wanted to try to cancel me, the only way I know how to fight would be one of two ways. One, I would just ignore them. Or two, I would just say no. And I would lean into it. And I would not bow down and I would not apologize. And I wouldn't care what they said. I would say your accusations are beyond stupid. And honestly, if my college supported that and had to let me and let me go because of that, Honestly, I'd be happier that they did because I would not want to be a part of that kind of organization. That You'd have grounds for. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd have grounds to sue them too. And yeah, I'd grounds for wrong, wrongful, wrongful termination, termination lawsuit. Yeah. But I mean, I wouldn't want to work for that company anyway. No. So the truth is, I'm like, yeah, I can tell you're totally weak, you're weak minded, and you're weak willed. So yeah. go ahead and fire me, and I will sue you for wrongful termination. Whether I win or not, I'm fine because I don't want to work for you. Yes, cancel culture is weakness of character. The only thing to combat it is having strength of character. And right. there are consequences. You might lose Absolutely. your job. Sure. Uh, so you have to be prepared to do that. Or you go with it, which yeah. is weakness. Which is weakness. Yep. Now, um, some of us may have some responsibilities beyond ourselves. Yep. So uh, um, I have responsibility. But I tell you what, if I told my wife what was going on, she would say, well, I'll follow your lead. Let's do whatever. So would my wife. And, We've actually um, talked about this, and my wife has told me, "Yep, do what you got to do." Right. So, so yeah, strength. That's yeah. the only thing you can do is have. That's strength. all I can think of. I don't know any um, other way to do it. Work for yourself if you can. Yeah. Then it doesn't matter. Yep. I would love to be able to work for myself. I know you would. You independent guy. You. Yes. I haven't read that article you're talking about about five E and what's wrong with it. And I'm not going to read it, but based on what you guys said, I agree with you 100%. You know, it's like saying Cyberpunk 2020 is a bad game because it doesn't include vampires. Well, that's the game. Sorry. D&D &D doesn't have fail-forward mechanics. That's the game. Sorry. And maybe 5e does. I don't know. 
you, you know, I, I don't like 5e. I've got plenty of reasons I don't like it, none of which were said in that article because those reasons, like you say, were silly. But whatever. Um, okay, let, let, let me move on to your main topic. Yeah, I think that article by that lady, she was just saying things she liked in a game. And then she was bemoaning the fact that 5e didn't have it. So that made 5e bad. It just maybe 5e may not be for you, lady. D&D yeah, &D may not yeah. be for you. Go play Power by the Apocalypse. Right, right. I don't, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's some kind of collectivist mindset where this thing has to have what I want or there's something wrong with it instead of looking at it and saying, this is what it does. Well, what it does, I don't like. So let me go and find something that does do what I like. And, and do that and everything has to everything has to conform to their conception instead of um or even having or just make it yourself yeah like, like we're trying to do with mud sorter like for yeah. example like you know you and i blast watsy and paizo but i don't bemoan the fact they got a lot of people playing the game Dude, they like good it for them. Yeah, people love those two games yeah. pathfinder one and two D D 5e you know play your butts off I'll play 5e. I won't play Pathfinder 2. I'll play Pathfinder 1. I mean, I would play that, but I just don't. Whatever, man. It's not, it doesn't make them bad games. Oh, Pathfinder 2 doesn't have the five saving throws from AD and D, so it's bad. How stupid is that? Right. It's stupid. <laughs> it's just yeah, different. It's, it's a not. In the words of um, uh, Max Liao from yep. um, Legion of Myth, Yes. He, the way he puts it is, uh, he doesn't like D and D fifth yep. edition because it's not D and D to him. It doesn't have the same somewhere along the line. Watsi has said, we're doing this thing. That's not the old way. We have a new way of doing things. A and new from, paradigm. And from Max's point of view, that's no longer D and D. So fifth edition may be a fine game, but it's not D and D. He doesn't you call it. it something else. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. 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 Character builds. Yeah, man. I th I really think it just depends on the table. I think any of the options can work. Although I, I'm not a big fan of. Oh, I have built games around people's backstory before. I'm kind of sort of pulling elements from people's backstory in my upcoming cyberpunk 2020 game to build but that's just going to be a short six you know four to six session mini adventure so so it's like a movie but um yeah i i don't know I, I like rolling up things randomly and just rolling with it i like having games where i can have a low dexterity thief and not be punished so that's another reason i don't like 5e and games of that ilk but um you know different people have different thoughts on all this kind of stuff and that's okay but yeah definitely everybody at the table has to use the same method or it's going to be hokey i like to ask jason about that low dex thief um yeah. are you is it a thief that's more like a thug than a finesse type of dude because if you got low dex in most versions of the game well i don't know i mean he, what we call he made what we call low what he calls low could be different you know, he consider a 12 low. And if you're playing AD and D, that is low. There's no, well, there's no bonus. It's not a penalty though, but there's no bonus. Right. So if you're talking be about average. below be average, average right. So you're if you're average. talking about below average as, as low, you got some explaining to do. Uh, it may just be not, it may not be a finesse thief. He walks up to people, knocks them in the head and takes their stuff. That's still a thief. Or steals when he can. He's just not terribly deft at yeah. it. But, but an old school me, thief, if you had, if you didn't have a dex bonus, if you didn't have a high enough dex, yep, you sucked for a long time because your chances to do anything were very low. Yeah. Ba base, uh, I think the base numbers for like first and second edition D and D. Well, I don't know about second. I can't remember how they did the thief. If it was pretty similar, if it mm -hmm. was. I don't know. then your base percentages except for climbing walls was like 15 or 20 percent i mean it was very low yeah you had a little chance to do the job you're supposed to do even if you had good stats right no matter um, right right now to, to be fair i get what jason's saying about 
I've done backgrounds too. Look, I, I have done, I've run the gamut of how I've run games. I've been, I've been super railroady when I was young to let the dice fall where they may to try to build a story, get every character involved with their background, try to make a cool narrative. So I'm doing very story, not quite story gamey, but heavier story or focus to now I'm just, I'm leaning more in toward old school. It's like, you know, roll up your character. Let's see what happens at the table. I really like that. Joe says that a lot. The story happens at the table. And I'm with that on character creation. I prefer, I'm really preferring random. I can't believe that I'm coming back to that, but I am. People complain about um, needing to do a lot to get going. Mm -hmm. But if you want to just sit down and roll some dice, you can still have a, a story emerge at the table with very minimal prep on anybody's part yeah um even the dm you don't oh, have sure. to you don't you don't have you're not going to be as little prep as the player the the people running the characters i can't i can't do it other dms probably can't yeah. but i can but you can you can start out with a, a few sentences on the world a bunch of random tables and let's say let's go and see what happens and then the story can emerge and you never know what it's going to be if you if you say I want this story. You're kind of setting things down kind of in stone and you're maybe putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, yeah. And you're definitely setting them some rails. Yeah. And I've done that. So rails are okay if they're wide. Yeah, wide enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's funny you mentioned dividing up the treasure. I, I've recently in a game, I won't go into details, but there's a spat between players. Well, the players said it was they were both at doing what their character would do, but 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 there was some hard feelings over some treasure, and it it it, it kind of devolved to the point where at the end of the session we had a we had a good talk to um, air out feelings and to clear the clear the air, and and in the end everybody it was a kumbaya moment. Everybody you know was happy and agree that you know let's do this a little bit differently in the future and whatnot so it worked out okay in the end and every now and then groups have to have that you know you everybody has to sit down and talk and say is anything bugging you about the game yeah like yeah this bugs me a little bit or this and and it you know air your grievances so this worked out good in the end but it's funny because it was um you know in the middle of that session i was thinking darn so and so is going to leave the game luckily they didn't we've had some some moments like that i think the treasure splitting um yeah that that can sometimes lead to a little bit of i wouldn't say hurt feelings but a little frustration for some people if they don't sure if you haven't gotten any loose in the last couple of drops you'd be like uh, i want something yeah yeah it can be a source of irritation for sure and there's interesting too when you think about this is interesting that i think what if a character what a player i mean you can you can come down and say roll my character random i have no idea what he's like i'm just gonna play or you could come down and say, I rolled a random, and this is what I want him to be like. And sometimes the way you want him to be like can cause friction in, within the group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as long as everybody's okay with that friction, it can work. But a lot of times I would say, you know, we talked about before, make decisions that are fun. Don't make decisions that just because that's what my character would do, even if right. that is what your character would do, because it may not be a fun thing that makes everybody else have a good time. It may screw their good time. Right. I'm okay with the occasional inner party conflict. And like you say, once in a while, like once every few years, having a player turn bad, you know, in a campaign for a twist, I'm okay with that. But it, it's got to be a pretty rare thing. I, I, I don't want to be doing PvP all the time or be at each other's odds at, all the time. I, I like for it to be more of a teamwork game. But the occasional monkey wrench thrown in there can make things interesting. Given that your party is mature enough to be able to do that and after the game be like, that was really cool what you did. So as long as everybody's, you know, okay with that kind of thing, I think it's definitely on the table. I'd be down for that. But I know there are players out there that get butt hurt over that kind of thing. Yeah, I can be a, I can be a little bit like that, a little butt hurt. Um, if you just invest... I'd like, yeah. If you invest a lot emotionally in your character, yeah, you can tend to, because you might say, oh, I can't wait till my character can do this 
you mm -hmm. think of the future of your character and then you get stabbed in the back by someone who thought you was your buddy and you're yeah. like what yeah and, <laughs> you know so you know at the very least you're going to be a little irritated a little yeah what the hell dude right but yeah I, I remember when we were this is why i don't do it now yeah because when i when we were 13 14 15 that's what we did so i yeah. kind of look at it like it's a little immature to to do all the conflicty stuff in within the party um i mean the other thing and it's something i've brought up before it's a little unfair to have turncoats in the party because mm -hmm. they have knowledge that they're the, the characters don't necessarily would, wouldn't necessarily have so they're going to act on stuff that they don't they shouldn't know about and be able to get away with stuff that they may not be able to may, may not have been able to without that knowledge yeah if like you know if you're like your character is secretly a you know your, your female drow a warrior is secretly a priestess of wolf right mm -hmm. and for several adventures she helps the party but she's actually a priestess of wolf and then in the big climactic battle with the matron mother she turns right mm -hmm. and that could be cool once and that's what you're talking about she knows stuff no one else does but there's also this possibility what if a dude just decides i'm gonna go dark side we had that happen back in the day, sometimes weirdly, but you could even choose to go dark side that could make sense for your character. What if your character was, you know, a pretty heavy duty gambler? He liked the seedier side of life, that rogue, let's say. And he ends up getting paid at some point to like, he gets really in debt and he goes, hey, if you kill that wizard, maybe Joe's wizard, Volsvar has been a pain in my guild master's side. If you kill him, you'll be debt free and I'll give you a thousand gold. I mean, and you're like, well, my character, and maybe you and that character have never really got along. He's like, yeah, what's one less wizard in the world? I mean, you could make that. Now, I would say the player should go, my character says, can I have a couple of days to think about it? And I'm going to say my character thinks about it. Like, I ain't turning on Joe. In fact, I'm going to go tell Volsor this what this guy wants. I would do that, even if I thought all along for the six months, my character's that kind of dirtball. Why wouldn't I do it, though? Because it's not fun for you. Right. It's going to ruin your good time and I'm going to kill your character. But that's Randy. And, you know, you can say, well, well, look, my character couldn't make that decision. Look, I'm a butthole, but I'm not that kind of butthole. Right. You know, no. I mean, if you if you run your party where you're not all buddy buddy. Yep. And you don't just, you know, when you're there's so many things that happen at the table and that every player is privy to, mm -hmm. but not necessarily every character. Correct. It's just, I think it's, uh, I just think it's a bad idea. Yeah, I've not been able to see it run. It's run well a couple of times, but usually they're pre-planned. I think, let's see, when it is a problem. Did I just play that one? <sighs> Start it. When it comes to player agency and, you know, turning people to stone and all that, I don't have any issue with turning people to stone or charm person, hold person, disintegrate, whatever. Like you say, what's good for the goose, good for the gander. And honestly, you know, getting turned to stone is basically, to me, like, say versus death. It's just part of the game, right? I, I do think there's an issue, or there, not an issue, but what, what I do find is kind of crappy is let's say you, you run games like you guys do. So you're playing six-hour games or whatever, right? You sit down on the weekend, you, play, you sit with your buddies, you play six to eight hours long. Well, something happens in the first half hour that takes that character out of the story for the rest of the game, the rest of the session. And now you're just sitting there for five, six hours twiddling your thumbs. I think there's a problem with that. Depending on the game. He's got a follow-up, right? Oh. Now, there are a lot of ways around that, right? Maybe you just roll up a new character when they're turned to stone, or maybe you give them a henchman to take over you know, there are things you can do to let that player stay engaged in the game. So this isn't really player agency. This is just not being a dick to your players, right? So if, a, if you're in a six-hour game and the player's taken out half an hour into the game, well, you don't want your buddy to sit there for five and a half hours. I mean, that's, you know, so you got to give them something to do. Let them roll a new character, give them a henchman, do something. 
And I think as long as you're doing that so they're still playing the game, it's not a big deal. I think when that whole person or turn to stone means, well, you know, go watch the extended cut of Lord of the Rings and come back and maybe you'll be back in the game. Nobody wants that. So I think, so that's not a player agency thing as much as, you, you know, you came to play the game, let them do something kind of thing. I think if you're out of the game for 20, 30 minutes, that's not as big a deal. Right. I agree with Agreed. all that. Agreed. Did you did you have anything to add? You were going to say no. something. He pretty I was much going to say what Jason yeah. said. He got yeah, yeah. The one time I am a little bit of, of a weak GM, and my players are going to see this when we play Cyberpunk 2020, is so in Cyberpunk 2020, a headshot is a minus 40 roll. So it's not, you know, it's pretty like, and it uses hit location, so one in 10 hits is going to, by average, going to be a headshot anyway. In that game, if you do, wow, well, hope, yep, hopefully that cop's not turn around and pull me over. Let me stop this recording for a minute. No, he's pulling somebody else. Okay. Anyway, in that game, if you take eight points of damage to the head, you're dead, period. And headshots do double damage. <laughs> so headshots are pretty much automatic kills. It's John Wick, the RPG, right? So I won't intentionally do headshots on my... Is I won't have my NPCs make headshots. If it happens for the random hit location, then that's okay. That's the game. So I don't feel bad if the characters get shot. The, the dice, the random hit location, all that, means a character takes a headshot and they die. But I'm not going to intentionally have my NPCs make, do John Wick and do every shot as a headshot, right? Just because that's kind of crappy as me, the GM. It, but if the players are doing headshots all the time, yeah, I know what's good for the goose, good for the gander, but I'm going to let them do that. I, I'm not going to hold that against them. They're, they're going to gain a reputation for that and maybe... You know, security for the bad guy when he sends strike teams against them after they set that MO, those bad guys are going to start wearing helmets and, and armor, and, you know, they're going to start trying to do something to protect against that tactic if they know the player's using the tactic. But just because of the deadliness of it, I'm not going to use it. Like, so if I disintegrate, I'm not going to, you know, use disintegrate every single battle as the opening move against the PCs just because that gets boring and it's kind of shitty. Um, I think I agree with you, Jason. I would say though, the headshot thing, I I would be leery to say I would never do it, but I'm with you. I would much prefer to let the dice to decide it's a headshot than me to decide it. But if the players are headshotting everything, at some point, I know me, I would be like, okay, I'm gonna preview them a John Wick bad guy. And they're gonna hear about him and they're gonna see him. And he's dropping dudes with bullets right in the middle of their forehead, left and right. And it's going to be obvious to the players, dude, that guy don't, he does not mess around. And if they decide they want to go after him, he's taking a minus four and I'm going for it every shot. Cause I've told them this is how this dude rolls. Or maybe they're really powerful and they're like, they, their goal, the whole campaign is take this guy out. When they finally face him, I'm not pulling punches. But no, but if a, you're going to... That's a one-time-in-a-campaign sort yeah. of thing. It's not but a... Me as a player in that yeah. sort of environment would go pick up a sniper, sniper rifle and then wait for him to be like a mile out. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Solution. Or Solution. whatever the range is. Not a mile. Yeah. I don't think there's any such thing as a sniper rifle shot with, from a mile away, but yeah, long the, distance. Yeah, and with disintegration, similar thing. Just because a wizard has it in his repertoire, especially you're talking D&D, doesn't mean he memorized it for the day. And even right. if he did, he may not want to shoot the big shoot his big gun right off the bat. Right. You know, um, desperate times. Uh, Tail of Manicor recently had a pretty tough battle, and mm -hmm. the bad guy had a, had a range of different things that they could do. Mm -hmm. That he could do. And Instead of the uh, instead of the Taylor Manticore guy just picking the most powerful thing over and over again, mm -hmm. he made it random. He, I think he had one or two planned things yeah. as one two, and then after that he rolled random. And and, and because the 
uh, bad guy could also melee. Yeah. He made it random between that and the magic. There you go. So, um, and Taylor Manticore is one guy running everything, including the yes. so-called PCs, yeah. um, to make it dramatic. And it's a pretty cool show. Anyone who's not checking it out, there's something wrong with you because it's yeah, cool. It's, it's very good. It's not your typical, um, um, lot, uh, what do they call it? Actual play. It's not right. really an actual play. It's more of a dramatic play. And yeah, it's one a, guy doing the story. And it, but it's say, really cool. Yeah, it's a dramatization of an actual play. Yeah. But you know, the dice decide a lot of things, but he still adds a lot of story elements in. And he has a variety of folks throughout the interwebs that help him do voices sometimes. And that's kind of cool. Right. And uh, it is a good, I think he br brings up a good way to have a bad guy, a powerful bad guy, not um, where the DM isn't out to get you right instead of just rolling out i think he might he might have rolled actually he saved his well anyway he used his most powerful thing in an interesting way cool and uh i mean he could have just he might have been able to tpk the the, the party if he right you know if he chose if he way. chose them from like most powerful to least powerful and just went down the line the only problem I would have with that, and this is where I just can't get away from, players always – okay, I'm going to back that. I'm going to back – I'm going to walk that back. Players usually, in my experience, do attack pattern delta. Every situation, they if they know it, they use their most efficient and most deadly maneuvers that they can, you know, at the moment, to, especially if it's a fairly challenging – fight it's like oh my god we're fighting a dragon bring in the big guns well if the bad guy's the big encounter why wouldn't he bring out his big guns you could make a good argument for that that doesn't mean I'm good. that doesn't mean you need to spam disintegrate every round but maybe look here comes a big fighter if i kill him the rest of them will run disintegrate right you know so yeah and that's a but you know that's and that of course we're talking of dangerous things to me it's more dangerous in higher levels when those kind of things come out. Right. But that's part of the game. Yeah. A lot of saber dives. A lot. You played that one. I was yep. wondering. Of course, even by Beck me, you, you, you know, prior to the rule cyclopedia, you had a myriad of races you could play in, um, what they call gazetteer was a 10 the orcs of thar they introduced rules to play all your evil humanoids your goblins and your orcs and your kobolds and your bugbears and they had you know the tables in there to to stat you know where you could not talking good level them up you know pretty far so that wasn't meant for a one-off they gave you rules to you know play them in a multi-year campaign so you know, D&D &D will definitely let you play Goblins, too, and, and at a fairly early time, you know, in the 80s. But all in all, good show. I will talk to you next time. Right. Um, hey, if, if playing humanoids that are evil, but we're going to, you know, ignore that um, for our table, uh, that's fine. Uh, that's not my cup of tea, but uh, hey. who knows? Yeah, but and Jason's right, though. It was That was not a third edition invention i'm playing these exotic i mean the drow came out in first edition yeah as a playable race so in which first edition unearthed arcana you can remember because the drow the female drow was the baddest that was the best cleric was that in it, the in unearthed arcana or was that in yeah. dragon magazine unearthed arcana you could play a okay. drow i'm almost 100 percent positive i'll look right. it up later but you can i know Remember for the longest time, everybody, if they played a female drow, they would always be a cleric because mm -hmm. not only did you get magic resistance, but you got dispel magic at like third or fourth level. Yeah, it was That's just an ability. It was pathetic. <laughs> Talk about just here is the most powerful thing you can practically the most powerful thing you can do. Yeah. And I think she was unlimited in levels, too. Think, the thing to is, America. they didn't like being out in the daytime. No, and I think I think I know I didn't I should have been a lot harsher with that penalty. Yeah. I think it's pretty severe. 
I think perhaps the whole got to stay underground thing was, uh, you know, hand waved a lot. Yeah. Hey there, guys. It's John here from the Red Dot Stories. Just listening to your OOC player choices episode. And I've just got to the bit where you're talking about just rolling 3d6 straight down the line for characters. And I've got to say, I'm a big fan of that sort of method for old school games. Although I do think it only really works if you're willing to just roll with whatever stats you've got and you don't have a predetermined idea of what your character should be. For example, I played in a game of old school essentials last weekend, randomly rolled my stats, and I ended up playing a gnome, which I probably wouldn't have played had I been able to choose the stats, I would have gone for something more familiar. So I think as long as you're willing to sort of roll with what you've got, it can actually like push you into playing different characters than you would normally. But whether you want that or not is down to you. Anyway, enjoy the episode, guys. Take care and I'll catch you soon. Yeah, I fully agree there. That To me, that's that's the charm of 3D6 down the line. I have no idea what I'm going to have. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm going to play. <laughs> right. Um, it does prevent... It's a solution for when you, I think you, maybe you're in a rut. Yeah. I've been playing this particular kind of character forever because I like them and I do it all the time and kind of getting bored. Well, why don't I just try to do more random and yeah. random. Uh, there's some, I think there's something to be said for that to alleviate some of those issues. There is. Looks like I'm not playing a wizard. It looks like I'm playing an elven cleric. All right, here we go. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And roll with it. I think we, like yeah. John was saying, we don't, we don't like, like a lot of people don't like just rolling with it because yeah. they have a predetermined kind of thing for their character. Right. In page background and whatnot. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. And I'm not sure, like I said, Hey, if you like that, that's fine. I yeah. know I, yeah. I don't usually write a lot of background, but I think about my character, but I don't know. Um, I usually come up with crap right at the table as I'm playing. So yeah, yeah do what you like. I'm, I'm not telling you you're playing bad. I just, yeah. I'm just thinking it's, it's like a, it's like opening the windows after a long winter, the house is kind of stuffy. You want some fresh air, let the fresh air in something like that can be like a fresh air freshener. But, you know, we have this question hobby. hanging over us, Joe, we need to talk about your infidelity. <laughs> you are once again, trying to control. I'm, pushing. You are I'm controlling this because I'm, my feelings are hurt. <laughs> i did i did go elsewhere for uh, it's not wasn't a podcast technically okay. well that makes it better it was it was a live stream yeah uh, and uh i tried i tried a couple of times to get you onto the discord and yeah. you were like um off with you I'm, I'm not confused. no time for that no time for that and i don't uh, brook discord in my life <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i went on to a live stream from legion of myth uh i think it streamed to it must have streamed to youtube they have they have plenty of followers for that That's and, why I um i joined it um while he was already going Mm -hmm. And he had invited a couple other folks and <clears throat> we had an interesting discussion about um, the importance of D and D mm -hmm. and Gary Gygax and mm -hmm. uh, Grognards and OSR and right. He was the, instead of calling him names, which I could do. No, no, I don't unkind, think so. That, that would be unkind. The guy was okay. It was uh, it was you and Max and Aaron the Pedantic and Scott Garibay, I believe was his name. Yes. He came on just from, he was one of the live stream guys chatting with Max. And I don't think Max planned this completely, did he? He invited you, right? Right. He was just, he just invited, he, uh, yeah, he asked me to come on. Okay. Uh, Aaron happened to be, you know, joined, uh, he uh, mm -hmm. knew they were having a live stream and yep. he was in the, whatever you call it, the chat. Yeah or whatever yeah, the chat room, yeah. and um I, I don't know if uh john asked him to or if he just came of his own accord and then somebody suggested the other fella 
Yeah. Scott. Who had a different viewpoint. You three were kind of, you and Max and Aaron were mostly simpatico on your ideas. Yeah. We're OSR, at the very least, OSR adjacent. Yes. And as you were talking, you had, had several discussions. And I, and I could, and look, this Scott guy, I thought he made a valiant attempt to support his background, but he said a couple of things that were actually not true. Well, let's put it this way. You know me, I'm kind of an aficionado. I'm not aficionado, but I've become recently a fan of the history of the game. Right. Uh, Aaron the Pedantic even mentioned Secrets of Blackmore. I was expecting him to say something when the guy said Dave Arneson wasn't really that big of a player in, in the creation of D&D. And I understand what he's saying, because from what I've seen, maybe not so much in Secrets of Blackmore, but in other places, I think Dave was not so good at getting manuscripts quickly and on time to Gary to get it into a book. And um, I think most people know that D&D was created, the old D&D white box was Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax. And then Gary made advanced Dungeons and Dragons didn't give Dave any credit. And that started a big, I think there ended riff. up being a riff and it ended up causing a lawsuit of which Dave Arneson won money, an undisclosed amount of money for. Um, but some folks say Gary just couldn't count on Dave doing that. But I do, I do believe from what little, and I have secrets of Blackmore. I have designers and dragons, which I'm going to, I'm going to quote from some other things too. That's a series by, I think it's Shannon Applecline. He did a, a history of role-playing games and i've got four books 70s 80s 90s and aughts of the history of rpgs and he he's it's pretty clear i think that arneson from what i've seen started the idea of a role-playing game he has to be given credit for role-playing um i think he's the first to do it even if you don't count i won't go into, i won't go too far in the weed weeds but he was definitely the co-creator and he, he i think he dm'd gary first and taught Gary about it. And Gary said, whoa, this could be awesome. Because Gary was coming from a war gamer viewpoint. Now, right. I'm not taking away from Gary, but I think Arneson was initially the idea guy. And um, I know in Secrets of Blackmore, he says, I know, he goes, Dungeons and Dragons, he has this little statement at the beginning of the video. D&D started in 19, he said 72 or something, which is two years before the white box. And he goes, if you ask me how I know, I know because I created it. And he taught a, he taught a class at Full Sail University and I think it said that in 2009, uh, after his death, Full Sail University honored his legacy by naming building on the campus for him. It's the only known honor of this sort for a member of the role-playing profession. I think Arneson has got a little weight behind his name. That's where I think, for one, Scott was off. Arneson's a pretty big deal. Right. Gary, Gary got the lion's share of things because he was more prolific. And, and in the end, you got to give Gary the most credit because he brought it to he really brought it to uh, to the masses. So it's not like he didn't, I'm not saying, I'm not pooping on Gygax. I'm just saying Arneson was probably the idea guy. Yeah, and, uh, I think Guy is a lot. it's pretty uh, well known that Gygax was the business guy. <clears throat> well, maybe not least, great at business, but he's the one who pushed it. Uh, he was very, um, what's the word? Aggressively business-like and he he worked he got stuff done he literally yeah. could he had made games before right um and then rob rob kuntz who is um he lived with guy gax when he was young like because he's his family his family life was bad this tells this is a good credit to gary and he took rob in and i've got i read this I got, and i got this website link hopefully you'll put it in the show notes um where a guy talks about a paper that rob kuntz wrote and he said the argument is stated that Dave Arneson's vision of what RPGs can be is stunted and too strongly tied to what have become more and more rigid rules with each version of D&D. He thus seems to advocate what those in the OSR movement are all about, rulings, not rules, and using the parts that fit what is right for you and your group. He points out that Gary Gygax advocated this early on, but for financial and profit reasons, he developed more rules to keep players tied to his version of the game rather than getting by without rules. While this is demonstrably true based on Gygax's own writings, it is not new. Within these pages, it is stated that Dave Arneson is the origin of role playing. And stating that Dave Wesley's Brownstein, or I'm going down a hole, or Gygax and Perrin's chainmail are not true antecedents of the fantasy game, later marked as Dungeons and Dragons. These were Kuntz's words on the letter, the last part. 
So my thought is, yeah, I think he was off there. I mean, and the designers and dragons even say none of the histories and in, in uh, none of the histories and designers and dragons would have occurred without the two of them. And that was referencing Gygax and Arneson. So he gets, he's definitely, I think it's even, but if you're talking about who was the most innovative, I'm going to have to say creating a whole new style of game goes to Dave. Right. And, <clears throat> and Scott Garibay <clears throat> put that all on Gary. Yeah. And I think he, he seemed and, to want to put through Arneson's. Yeah. Comment. And then as if Arneson was just some associate that had really nothing to do with anything, yeah. which, you know, um, I don't know that anybody can really do that with any credibility, but it seems to, but from the conversation, I think that that is a, he's fashioning that revision of history from my point of view, that doesn't mm -hmm. seem right. No. Um, that revision of history from his I won't say worship because that'll put him in a very negative light. He was a huge fan of Gygax. He said that Gygax should have a statue erected in his honor that is larger than the Statue of Liberty <laughs> because Gygax is that important. And that America. Dean, right. <laughs> and that, well, probably the world or the universe. Yeah. Right. But, um, and that the game that Gary created, Arneson didn't matter, right? is in essence kind of transformative of the culture at large. Mm, that, that, was his, that was his main argument, wasn't it? it was transformative. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's everywhere. d and is everywhere. You can ask anybody about role-playing games and they'll say D&D. &D. And I'll have to say, if you say role-playing game to most people, they'll say, what is that? I think to give him a little bit of, I'll give him a couple of nods. One, I think D and D is clearly bigger than it's ever been. Sure. It's part. It's part of the zeitgeist of modern popular culture for sure. I don't think that's due to guy gags. I think it's due to critical role. I think. I think what I mean by that is, I think the reason everybody knows D and D now are places like Cl Cl Critical Role, uh, Vin Diesel. Um, the different people who's the who's the night show the late show host that plays oh i didn't know that yeah there's there's a late show host that plays um dang it there's also the big bang theory yeah big bang theory i'm just saying it all got in there and it is but i think he's given it a little bit too much it has a place in nerd culture agree it had a big place and it, a big place it's it's the big boy table it has a smaller place in culture at large, but I don't think it has transformed our culture in any kind of way. Um, no, I think it I think it's also kind of carried. I'm not the focus. Some people would say that nerds are kind of popular now. Yes. So, <clears throat> and the ones that are have brought their love of the game with them. Yes. So, and then there it's, there's enough people that play it that it could be mentioned in a number of uh, venues and people will recognize it, some people. But I still think most regular people, now, most regular people, if you say Dungeons and Dragons, they might recognize that. That's but true. if you say role-playing game to them, they will say, what? <laughs> right. When we, Or at best, if they have a hint of nerd culture, they'll go, wow? You mean like wow, like World of Warcraft? I've got maybe, that maybe, yeah. But they have to be, they have to be nerd adjacent. Um, right. If they're not now, back when we were young, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, you mean that game where you worship Satan? Satan? Yeah, back I, in the day, I heard that a lot in the early eighties. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you mentioned that, but uh, not so much now. I will say, and maybe this is what he's hoping for: is Five E has brought D and D, or Five E has hit upon a time where D and D's you know, D&D is coming out of the new edition at the right time. I wonder if fourth edition had waited until 20, 2009, whenever 5e came out, something like that, uh, 2009, no, 2012, I don't know. Anyway, if that had been fourth edition's release, would it have still had the same 
would it have been just as big? Meaning if third edition had just come out when 5e did, I don't know if it's 5e the game or if it's the fact that role-playing games have got a big seat at the table now and people like to role play and it's, you know, computer games, have, computer games have helped D&D too, mm -hmm. back and mm -hmm. forth. So yeah, I'm not sure. Now I will say this too about Arneson. You could make an argument that a good idea and five bucks might get you a happy meal. So him being the, if it had just been Arneson's baby, I don't know if D&D would have come out in 74. Yeah, but if Gygax was the only one involved, it would have been a similar situation. He would have had a war game. Right. It, it, would, it would have been totally different. It, it took oh. the two, it had to have been the two of them working together. And yeah, I mean, others, others too. Sure, yeah. It's not like they were by themselves in a vacuum. Oh. So there, there were others brother, involved. There was, and Tim Cask, he helped out early on. I mean, there were several old school guys. And Dave, if you watch Secrets of Blackmore, a lot of dudes that you know, play tested that game with him. And it came out of that Brownstein game, which is kind of a role play war game that some one other dude, I don't have his name, but yeah. So I don't know about that. So the, I, I think he was trying to push something that was. Uh, he may, he's okay. Not quite, not so quite the, way, the way I looked at it afterwards was. Uh, you do you remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Yes. Okay. When Richard Dreyfus was sitting at the dinner table, and all of a sudden he started looking at his mashed potatoes mm -hmm. and forming them into a mound. Right. And then over, I'm not sure how long it was supposed to have occurred in the movie. It's been a while. Yeah. He created a giant sculpture that resembled a mountain. Okay. And in the midst of that, he was looking at his before it became much, he was looking at his pile of mashed potatoes and mm -hmm. he said, this is important. This means something. Right. So he, um, Dreyfus's character was getting some sort of psychic impressions from aliens who were about to land. Right. Right. So some really big earth changing event was about to happen. Right. And he was kind of keyed in. Sure. And, um, so Scott Garibay is Richard Dreyfus' character, and the mashed potatoes is D and D. <laughs> okay. So yeah. he's looking at D and D as some, maybe not cosmically meaningful, but definitely historically, culturally, not quite religiously, but seems close with the whole statue thing um important and um he put he he yeah that's the way that's the way i looked at it Our historically speaking D, D the game is not quite 50 years old yet it will be soon we'll bring that up later mm -hmm. um but it i think it has a small imprint on the united states culture and even smaller and, 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 and because it's it's created so many of the role-playing games it created a whole industry it was a whole mm -hmm, style mm -hmm. a new style of game where there's no win conditions so i would say it has an imprint and historical at a bare minimum it deserves a solid strong footnote yeah in annals of history yeah it might, it might even get a sentence right right now in the end it could be more significant but right now mm, um Another thing I had, and so he, he was trying to imply then that he said this, he, he was really disappointed that old grognards like you guys weren't on the front lines jumping into 5e and play testing. Why do you think he wanted, I couldn't figure out why he wanted people that did, that he basically wanted to say OSR people should like 5e and be a part of it so they can shape the game through the surveys or something. He's a D and D evangelist, a fifth okay. edition evangelist. Okay. And he's fitting. He's, he was fashioning his argument in such a way to shame us mm -hmm. into, oh, maybe I should do this. And the way he fashioned his argument was that we were lazy cowards for not, for abandoning D and D and going into the OSR style games, because like you said, he was, he, and he repeated this a few times yeah. uh, that we, our voice was missing. Yeah, from the D and D community, you know, and we kept telling him that we don't want that community, and he he made it seem like 
there is a community one mm -hmm. and it's D and D and it's fifth edition and that's the community. Well, that's a different topic, but I agree. Yeah, that's <laughs> else. But I was going to say, I thought, and good. And I thought Scott would seem like a pretty nice guy. He wasn't being a butthole, you know, no, 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 but he did make comments. I think the idea that we should, that, you know, you should not abandon 5e and I'm not saying, and I really have it at all. I like 5e. I'll play it. Joe will, if I twist his arm, he'll play, it. You know, he'll play it though. If I twist his arm, yeah, don't let yeah. him you otherwise, but he ain't going to run nothing and he ain't going to buy any books. But the point is, the point is, Watsy, and I thought Aaron the Bedanic made a great point. Once we thought that last survey, I was doing it too. I had the same experience as him. I've answered four or five questions and they booted me out. Because and they were questions about what I played. You right. know, he said he said BX, and I was like, I was messing around with swords and wizardry, and boom, I was gone. <laughs> but, so what it is, and that voice that you know Scott thinks we should have, they don't want to hear it. No. If they did, they would let us stay in there and answer more questions and say, Why are you playing this? How come you're not playing 5e? What don't you like? They don't want that question to be, they don't want to ask that at all because they don't want those answers. Mm -mm. We, as much as he was trying to make it sound at the same time that he was calling us lazy cowards, yeah. you're lazy cowards, but the community needs you. <laughs> yeah. They lazy don't need us and they don't want us. And yeah. we matter very little. Mm -hmm. We're in a niche hobby. Mm -hmm. And we're a niche part of that niche hobby. The yep. grognards like us, though I'm not fully, I mean, there's the grognards that are like, if you don't play first edition straight by the rules, you're not playing D and D that's a group of people, maybe yeah. even second edition. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. sure first edition or, or maybe even Beck me or I guarantee there's people that say, if you're not playing the white box, you're not playing D and D. Right. So, um, we're not even that. We just don't like the current direction that Watsi has taken the game. We mm -hmm. liked third edition, though. I think if it came out now, we probably would still favor more OSR games, most yeah. likely. But well, I don't know. Having it's I possible. Think, I felt like our third edition experience, Joe, was the right. It might have been lightning in a bottle, the mm -hmm. right time. And, and when I say that, we played 10, 12 years and Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know about you, I was drawn to, oh, look, they have codified movement and attacks and the round and full round action and, and, and an attack action. Mm -hmm. and, and they've codified movements so where you're using the minis and spacing. It was a new, a new part of the game that was really significant. Not that you couldn't use minis before, but this really latched onto it. And something about third edition spoke to me. And then after eight, 10, 12 years, whatever it was we played, after Pathfinder I was like, you know, I'm kind of tired of counting squares all the time. Right. This chess game's driving me crazy. And so we're being drawn back to a simpler older games. Game. Yeah. yeah, older games. Um, or an older mindset at the very least. Yes, I agree. Because you and I definitely have some fondness. Um, I, th I liked how you got after 13th Age a little bit. Our buddy Dave and others that are big fans of 13th Age should really watch that because Joe, I think, eloquently states some of the issues he has with 13th Age that just wear, has wore on me too as time passed. The whole can't do random encounters. Uh, look, that's just, I don't like a completely cookie cutter scenario. And it's that's very predictable. About. It is. It's the game very predictable. Has, we talked about his predictability and it wears me out a little bit. Yeah. Um, now he made a comment too about Lorraine Williams and a lot of folks have given her some crap. And he was saying that she wasn't that bad. The prevailing theory is either she was pretty good, she saved the company with her crafty business mindset, or it's a theory that she ran it into the ground. And from what I've re read, uh, it seems like that most of the people at uh, TSR when she was there, the co-workers, thought day-to-day -day she was fine. But Designers and Dragons makes several comments about her situation. One of them was... Gary Gygax was the co-creator of our industry who drove its growth through its first decade before he was unceremoniously unseated from his position at TSR, first by the Blooms, then by William. So the Bloom brothers sold their shares to William after she had been brought in by Gygax. And she's a, she's a part of the Buck Rogers dynasty. She, mm. she, her family is from that. And she tried to make uh, the Buck William, the Buck Rogers role-playing game, which was a 
colossal failure and a few other things. Um, she did professionally manage TSR for a while. The thing was, she wasn't really a gamer at all. Some say she looked down on gamers, but again, most of the folks that work with her seem to say at least she was pleasant enough. So I don't know if that was true or not. Um, lawsuits definitely increased once Williams took the, took the helm. You know, remember TSR used to stand for, oh, how, what are these, how they say a T it? T and a dollar sign R. Yeah, and boy, yeah. they would sue you if anything even remotely came out on the internet about D and D. And there's rumors that once got, once she got in there, the reason Gygax left, and he intimated that Gygax just left because he knew he was done, or I don't know how Scott portrayed no, it. No, but I'll he, tell you. I'll tell you. Okay, thank you. The way he said it was, he knew that D and D was bigger than him. <laughs> <laughs> that is not why he left. No. No, it says um. Let me find this here. Um, if anything, their lawsuits increased after Lorraine Williams took the helm. Many of these new lawsuits were against an interest that Gary Gygax was involved in post TSR. This led to speculation that Williams was pursuing a vendetta against Gygax because of his failed attempt to prevent her from taking over the company. He tried once she bought those shares to take it to a judge to say, hey, this was not right. But apparently he didn't have enough money to stop her. So um, that was really it. I mean, I, th I think he had a point, something about how they couldn't, the Bloom Brothers can't do that. But I think I think it's hard for me not to believe that the Blooms and Williams at some point had a problem with Gygax. To be, but to be fair, he was kind of playing Hollywood at the end. He was out in California for a while doing the cartoon and talking with the big wigs, trying to get a movie done. He wasn't back home producing more content, which they needed. I mean, at least that's the feeling I got. But this um, Designers and Dragons, at least the 70s edition, I would suggest anybody that has that book or can access, it's a good read to see what happened. And um, he, their statement is basically in the end, TSR was her company, and she finally did run it into the ground. And not that she was bad, but in the end, I mean, they were doing stuff like selling uh, crochet kits, D and D stuff. Um, what else was it? There were some other things too. They were selling. Dra well, Dragon Dice was a good idea, but they went crazy on it, bought too many, and overproduced it. And she went crazy with the novels. I, I remember when the novels blew up. It's a new novel every week, and uh, they just got too deep in debt to their to certain people. Um, for producing that stuff and they couldn't keep it up and then she ended up having to sell the watsy though i think scott was right i think she did make a pretty penny off of it yeah but i mean that doesn't mean she that doesn't job. mean anything i i would guess from and again there's different people say different things i would say L lorraine williams at best was mediocre because she had some good and some bad when she first came in she was better at organizing the she was more of a business person than a lot of the people that ran it they were right. gamers who ran a business she was a business person but she did have a hand in ruining it if um D, D was making good stuff and making good money and was profitable and all that stuff mm -hmm. when she sold it yep wizards would probably have not done a whole lot except maybe a couple of positions and just let it go kind of like hasbro when it mm -hmm. bought wizards wizards it, yeah it, they, there might have been some managerial things going on but they pretty much let wizards people handle the game the game production yes uh now fifth edition might have been a hasbro decision i don't know um but um uh, it was probably 11 months I think is what we figured mm -hmm. is either just under or just over a year when the, the last really D and D product came out. Yeah. And, and we were all like, what's going on with, with TSR and blah, blah, blah. And then we found out that, um, which the coast bought it and we're like, Oh, maybe they'll, they'll do something with it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they were, they were doing anything. It was oh, like was a, a year. year. It was a that, year. That, oh, they had pallets a product that they couldn't move because they had to pay for it still right the printers right. they owed like millions of dollars to printers and what i heard i mean 
I remember waiting for my Dragon Magazine subscription. Like, I haven't got a Dragon Magazine for four months. What's going on? And I'm going to the store, nothing new. I've got all the crap. There is nothing new. That's crazy. Right. Um, so if she now, was running a tight ship. I'm not sure. That doesn't seem like it to me. No, I don't think so. And here's one thing that this shows to the possibility of her being petty. And I don't know. The, this is what I read. And this I'm not sure where I got this, but I probably Designers and Dragons. Um, it says, Williams and TSR sued Mayfair Games for City State of the Invincible o Overlord simply because Gygax wrote the foreword and was credited as the author of AD&D, which he was. <laughs> and because of somehow her owning and him, this is after he was out of the company, and they sued them. And of course, everybody's heard of the, of the suing of for Dangerous Dimensions, right? Gygax's own game, because it was D and D and he had to change it to Dangerous Journeys. Eventually, TSR bought that out from him. He couldn't win those suits because of cash. It wasn't because he was wrong, you know? But they tried to get him for that. And so um, she does strike me as having a bit of a vendetta against Gary. Yeah. But to be fair, that could be an important thing. I mean, it could be a, I guess, like I said, I guess in the end, she did some good things. She did some bad things, but she was at the helm when it went down, so. Um. Comment about community, and I've heard this in a lot of places. I've heard Eric Tinkar comment about talk about community, and I got a definition here. Two of them. That's all the internet. It said a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common, or B, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Is there a D and D community? Well, the question is: Is there a right one? I would say no. I mean, we might have in common the hobby. Right. All of us. Yes. But no playing game hobby. Beyond that, if you're going to say community, I would say the role playing hobby is made up of many communities, not that the role playing hobby is a community in and of itself. It's made up of I many. I would say even the DD hobby. Is clearly made up of many communities. Yeah, the OS, even the OSR. And self has, is made up of multiple it's, communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though the, the farther you drill down, the more you have cohesion. At least with the OSR, there is some something beyond just the, the game itself. Um, but then you have some fraction fractioning in there as well. Yeah. So making it out to be a singular community is pretty much not true yeah. and and you know i don't really care if there's a community or not to be <laughs> right. honest i mean i guess what we're doing with the podcast and asking people to listen and everything we're maybe building a sort of community there mm -hmm. and i care about our gaming group right um and the larger one i mean we have uh, a table that we'll all sit down to a smaller part of us but yes. we have about 20 guys um 20 uh, maybe more including mm -hmm. wives and right. girlfriends and uh we are a kind of community yep uh but i i wouldn't once you get much bigger than that i calling it a community is probably a misuse of terms yeah it's because it's it'll be hard to find. yeah sharing common attitudes i mean how many common attitudes do you have to share to be a community two right. one 25 26 so yeah and it, it's it's hard to say i think right did you get a chance to watch the uh gygax video you you mentioned i just remember when it came up to him and he was on screen he kind of was kind of aggressive yeah. but i did not get a chance to look at it well did i remember I did i remember it correctly I didn't see him do that. I was looking for him going really aggressive, but he was, he was definitely offhandedly saying, yeah, this thing, like, it was Pat pulling was on it too. The lady that brought mothers against D and D and was trying to say it was all bad. But anyway, yeah, he was very dismissive of, of the arguments and it was on 60 minutes. I don't, he might've been aggressive, but I had a trouble watching the video because it was kind of, he was in two parts and it was a little screwed up. So, oh. But it was kind of fun to watch it again when I could see. Yeah, uh, you were. I don't remember him being come up in anybody's face, but he definitely seemed dismissive, and he definitely looked young. That was kind of neat to see him. I just so. what I remember is that he was. Um, I didn't remember him being very charismatic. 
no, 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 that was correct. Yeah. He was not, he didn't come off well on the screen. Yeah. He didn't all. come off well. It's like, you shouldn't have put him there. But he's not a, he's not a politician. He's not no. an actor. And he, he's a it's, perfect. It's not a dig at him. They just, he's, they didn't yeah. have a, I'm sure they had a PR person by then mm -hmm. that they could have put there, but he probably, you know, I'm Gary, so I'm going to be the dude doing this. Yeah. Right, so. right. And then, you know, uh, I don't even know if I care about the next point you yeah, know, there about that. women and CEO. I mean, yeah, he, have, a woman, he, have a woman as a CEO. And he yeah. said something like, the, we, we have businesses now wrestling with the correct number of women in their, in their in, in employment. And I'm like, there's no such thing as that. There's not the correct number of men. There's, there's not no a correct, correct number of women. There's a correct number of people you need to have there. And whatever they are is what they are. Yeah, and quit. Yeah, I'm not down with quotas. People can believe whatever they want, but I'm not down with that. Right. Um, yeah. We did. We did. We kind of skip over. We might have Was number there a part three. Don't need to be I think, part. I of think it. we had talked about it. Gygax's legacy. Um, oh, it was like. Yeah, we did. We kind. We did talk. Yeah, about we kind of had it all. So yeah, 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 yeah. Go back to Atlanta, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, like I don't mean to be bashing Scott, but I, like I said, I kept thinking, man, I wish I was there, especially with the comments about Gygax and history and Arneson. It's like, dude, I've just read this stuff. So, yeah, but some, I was just anybody. Some crazy ideas. Yeah, but you know, it's it's probably coming from a place that he loves the game and he wants it to be better. Uh, he might be gung ho about it, but I think I don't know what he thinks we can do. Because if we get in there, if we were to come as a group, as a small community, and all jump into Five E and start playing and trying to make comments to Watsy, they would not want to hear what we have to say. No. So right, I, mean, I don't right. care. They would. They, they would. They've proven they wouldn't, and I know right. they wouldn't. Just look at um, the newest Witchlight and Strixhaven, and the one before that was Strix, Strixhaven's not out yet, but the one, gosh, what was it? The one with Tasha's, where all of a sudden your race doesn't really matter. You just put your plus two wherever you want. Right, right. And, oh. and you know, apparently we're supposed to just learn the language. He he kind of give away part of him, the underlying. I think he wasn't really saying all of, of um, his premise. Because one of the things he says is we weren't willing to do the work. The, <laughs> the hard work. The hard work. We weren't. And generally if someone says we've got to do the work yeah it's it may not be mm -hmm. but uh with him but a lot of progressive intersectional types yeah. use that phrase so that to people that you know you've got to do the work of and then you either put feminism or anti-racism or some other ism or, so, or some other thing and you have to do the work and me and, Tasha's cauldron. I've got a black pen here. I'll uh -huh. do some work. Yeah, yeah. Do some work. And you I'll, know, I'll mark out some crap. You may think all of these things are fine, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. but this is a this is a hobby. We're playing a game. Mm -hmm. It's not important beyond that. There's not mm -hmm. some thing you can say more than it's important to me because i like to play and i like to hang out with my friends and there's a whole there's a there is a cultural aspect to D, &D but it's confined within our hobby it's not but what about the children what about the children joe he oh, did say oh, that yeah. in a very careful way what about the okay. children <laughs> right. he said that you need D, D. it has to be the D, &D game that if you're going to bring role playing to some underprivileged, essentially underprivileged children, mm -hmm. and um, the things that can be positive about the game, which there are some, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you if you use it correctly, mm -hmm. you can use it to help you become better at reading, maybe better at writing, a little um, better at math, maybe better at math, maybe better at logic, maybe mm -hmm. if you let it. Um, it can help you um, in social situations if you let it. Yeah. Some people don't let it because it's not, that's not peculiar to D&D &D though. Anything no. where anything, any kind of hobby or pastime or thing that brings people together to accomplish something cooperatively can, can have a lot of the same things um, positive about it that he attributes to 
just D and D. This is all. This is all D and D's thing. It's this right. no. thing that he called. I don't know. What about chess? How but about he 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 pretty much said you couldn't do it with another role playing game. You couldn't take Thirteenth Age or Savage Worlds to that um, group of underprivileged children, teach them about role playing with that game. It has to be D and D. I actually disagree with that because I believe specifically 13th age would be a better tool to teach someone about role playing. And that's because I recently taught a 50 plus year old man in the last year or two, one of our friends that recently joined us in role playing, mm, an older mm-hmm. gentleman, how to play. And 13th age was the simplest to wrap your mind around. There's less moving parts. And he's played 5e, he knows how it works, but 13th age is a good intro. It right. absolutely is. Yeah, I would right. probably argue fourth edition is probably better than fifth for that. Right. It's simple. I mean, but there are, I don't even know how many games, role right. playing games that you could do oh, that with. Thousands. Yeah. Now, I would admit, I probably wouldn't begin with uh, riffs, <laughs> but you could. You, you could. Know. It would and be I a would mistake. With, yeah. I think it would be, but you could do mm-hmm. that. No. <laughs> we could have handled riffs as our first game mm-hmm. easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that because we had D&D first and then Rifts and yeah. Rifts was the system was close enough to D&D that we were like this is kind of like D&D but does things weird yeah yeah we only think it's weird because we started with D&D yeah and because the rules aren't terribly good <laughs> yeah there there are some issues with the rules there's some inconsistencies the world is so there's cool. a, it almost makes up for it it does so yeah anyway okay. Yeah. All right. So are we done beating this issue to the de- to death? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have a link to the, a, uh, the video. It is long. I don't yeah. step in until I'm almost an hour in. Oh, I thought it was <laughs> 10, 15 I minutes. Oh, well. I thought so somebody, somebody else, part. I don't know how long that honestly, I don't know how long they were on before I jumped in, um, Not too long. but it's, it's worth listening to folks. Definitely give it a listen. A lot of good comments and discussion. I don't think it's ever going to be, it might at some point in the future, um, be on, be an audio format, but, uh, um, Max over at Legion of Myth, um, Mm -hmm. is catching up. They, 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 their primary, um, focus is on YouTube on their video on their, because they, they run live stream and their primary focus is on that. And then, um, they put the episodes out in whole on um, as a podcast, but it's delayed. And right now oh. it's um, just under a year delayed. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, wow. it's very delayed. Well, part well, of it because it was because he moved from, uh, he was in Germany for work and then he moved back into the States and it put, pushed, oh. and uh, when that happened, uh, lots of stuff got delayed. So and that's some of my concerns. Should we go to streaming if we're going to lose our? Because Tinkar seems to. He hasn't given up, but he rarely gets his stuff posted up. Well, yeah, that's not going to be me. Yeah, I stay up till one or two o'clock in the morning to make sure we get something out. <laughs> you work so hard, man. I appreciate it. So yeah, so moving along. Yeah. To the contest. Oh, I thought we were going to skip that till the end. Well, we're going to skip doing it, but we can talk about it. Because oh yeah, the contest of champions. We're yeah, gonna roll so it at the end. Yeah. At the end of the episode, we're going to to do the well, initially we we're going to do it at the end because um, well, I was going to suggest at the end so that we could give some folks that are supposed to be sending us their email so right. I can to do that. But if they don't by the end of the recording, yeah, um, uh, well, sucks to be them. Yeah, they can wait till at, they can wait till the next uh, cutoff contest. So it sounds like uh, we got thirteen folks right now. Hopefully, we'll have more. Yes. And I got a D fourteen, and I'm going to roll it and subtract one, and we'll get to it again. I'll explain it again. And when I, if I roll a one, I'll roll again. So I don't have a D thirteen. It's one of those beautiful Zochi dice for DCC, but right. I couldn't find my D thirteen. Dungeon crawl classics. You'd think yeah. they would have a D thirteen. They have all kinds they of other do. funky dice. They probably do. I got a whole bag of them, but I didn't get to the whole thing. So, but right, uh, right before we started recording, though, um, I was ha- we were having problems with the website. So yeah. I was like, well, it's a good thing. We'll just do it at the end anyway. 
we were even possibly going to just roll the dice and then announce later because we weren't sure if we were going to be able to do it. Well, but we'll, we will we'll do it near the end, yeah. And we'll do it at the end. And yeah. um, we should have I remind reached... folks what the should I remind the folks what the um, what the books are, the prizes, or you want to go ahead and tell them we have reached what? Go ahead, we have reached 67 viewers on yeah. subscribers on uh YouTube. Uh, oh, due to I think two big inputs. One is the folks over at Legion of Myth. Thank you, they, dudes. Uh, they um they exist on YouTube and on Discord. I will have mm -hmm. links to um both. I think it's fine to maybe i'll ask about the discord link yeah maybe a private thing but it's not private they have links to their discord on oh, their okay. youtube videos sure. so it's public knowledge already i'll put it there we, discord, have, we should have a discord channel we do we do well shoot we need to get to it then i need to be on it so. yeah that, remember we were, we were using discord at first to record oh, and then that's it, true. it was we were funky it didn't really it wasn't very um intuitive how to do all the things we wanted to do which weren't very many anyway we've got 67 uh subscribers now um still it's kind of a disparity out of those 67 subscribers mm -hmm. only 13 of them felt the need to give us their email address so we oh. can uh, so that they could fully it's participate important. yeah fully participate in the contest they could win the most important it could be message it, yes out of the could win out of the abyss, a 5e D and D supplement, you could help change the face of the world because D and D 5e is so important. If you win, you can have this. Or if you want to pull a little Pathfinder action, you could take Maximum X Crawl. Pick that as your prize. Sweet. And if you're a Savage Worlds, you could take Codus and Furnace. So those are the three things that are up. Whoever wins gets to pick one of those three things, and I will ship it to them post haste. Right. And uh, so after today, we are going to have the next threshold be 100. Okay. Cool. I think that after 100, we should have bigger gaps. Yeah, like maybe 250, 5,000, something yeah. like that. 600 billion. Yeah. We'll eventually. 600 that. billion. The whole so, world. Yeah. All right. All right. So next, are we ready to move along? Yeah, let's do it. The next edition of D D is is it announced or is yeah. it hinted at? Yeah. It's nope, an they announced it. Uh, there's going to be the 50th anniversary in 2024. There will be an update to D D thanks to Silent Josh. He got us toward this. We've got the link at comicbooks.com. Um I don't know, there was a recent, was it PAX or something? There was some recent event where four or five of the Wizards big wigs got on there and they said, yeah, and they gave some hints to what settings. It's like three new settings coming out or Eberron was the first and there's going to be two more. A lot of folks think the setting is going to be Planescaper, Spelljammer, because they're coming out with a book, Monsters of the Multiverse. Um, and, it's a very short article. Yeah, well, they didn't say a whole lot. Mm -hmm. and um they basically said yeah we're gonna put together some of the changes we saw we made through tasha's and the other books and make it official um oh and so well, is this gonna be reprints well they're gonna reprint all the core books but i think they call it an update to the game so well, what i'm saying by reprints, five point, huh? what i'm saying by reprints is if if we take that literally then what they're going to do is reprint online stuff into their hardbacks, which I think they said they were going to do anyway. But yeah, and some of their, have. and some of the, I think you're going to get some some of the crap from Tasha is going to go into the player's handbook. I mean, you know, you're going to be able to put your plus two wherever you want, probably, and you know, you can go to proms and stuff. And I don't <laughs> have no idea what they're going to be doing. Sounds so crazy. Tall. It's so crazy. So is it 5.5? They're not going to call it that. No. They're just going to say, they're saying you can play this with your old books too. Yeah, they always say that. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't play 3.5 with the old 3.0. I tried no, it. It was a mess. No, no, Power no. attack was different in both games. So yeah, it's. I'm going to say it's going to be sixth edition. 
who knows, but it might be 5.5. I mean, they're just trying to sell more books and you can't blame them. And to be fair, fifth edition is 10 years old. So. When, I mean, when third edition revised into three, five. Yeah. They said we were just going to, they were just going to change a couple of things. And what you ended up having was a new game. I mean, not terribly new, but new enough. Yep. Well, you know, it's as old as um, two E D and D um, went until nineteen eighty nine. Was published in eighty nine, and it went all the way to I guess ninety nine. So it was ten year span. Hmm. So you're looking at. As at least as long as second edition by 2024, when this is coming out, 5e will be 10 years in the 10 years old. And that's kind of the longest run they've ever had of, of a game. They're tying it. So to me, seems if they keep their pattern up, that's right time for a 6e. They won't call it that. I think they'll eventually call it that. I think they'll say no. And then when it comes out, people are like, holy crap, this is really different. So oh, they've been numbering things. I mean, it's just, why wouldn't they? It doesn't make any sense. Well, and I think they're trying to get away from using additions because they just want to get that upgrade all. Oh, all that's the, true. That's upgrade, true. Upgrade, they upgrade. might, yeah. yeah It'll be called Dungeons and Dragons, and Dragons Anniversary Books, and they're going to put new covers and all that poop. So they're going to have, I, I'm really, I really think they're going to end up changing their mind on that because they're going to end up needing to call it something different than just. Dungeons and Dragons, because it's going to cause some market confusion. Yeah. Which Dungeons and Dragons? What are you talking about? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, they may not. They may they may stick to their guns and just call it D and D. They may not have any kind of extra qualifier or anything like that. But I think they. I think it's a. I think it's at least even money that by the time it comes out, they'll have some sort of. Um, they'll say Dungeons and Dragons something. It won't yeah, just and be. And when they won't call it fifth edition, no. it won't be. No, it's not going to be fifth. Don't kid yourself. They've done it before. They've done it every time. They're going to, there was a 4.5. Essentials was 4.5. I don't care anybody says. 3.5 came out. There was a 2.5. Players options was 2.5. Yeah, yeah. They'll now, call granted, it something. At least 2.5 was truly optional. But it's if you brought right it in the in, title. Yeah, I mean, you, you could literally not, because we did. We can't, I, I, I bought the black books and didn't use them. I used high level campaigning and that was it for ideas. Right. But the truth is, if you implemented at least a good chunk of that crap into your game, you're playing a different game. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's bad or good. It just was different. Yeah. And we'll see. I mean, I got a feeling sixth edition is coming out. I think we're going to be somebody, I hope somebody we know buys one because I want to borrow the book. <laughs> and I want to review it because I am not paying for it. I'm not paying a dime for it. I'm not. No way. I'm out. I'm no. out of that. Out of that turnstile. All right. right. Yes. Buy it if you want. I'm not. If you're a completionist, then you'll probably buy it no matter what. But oh, that is I, my nature, but I just don't know if I can do it. It would kill me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, not excited. No, not even remotely. But it is news. Yes. All right. Moving along to main topic. The con game. Yeah. As in running, planning, creating, and running a game at conventions. Big, big cons, not so big cons. And for our reference, Cabin Con. Right. Yeah. And we haven't talked about Cabin Con for a long we time. Well, you know, our uh, winter meeting is going to be coming up. I got to make a decision. Yeah. I think Patrick may be hosting again, maybe not. So uh, sometime in November, guys, if you're listening, my cabin Connors, we're probably going to sometime in November, we're going to be having that meeting. So probably expect the first or second week. I'll, I will be once because October hits the end of this week. So I got to I got to get it out there. Patrick will probably hear this tomorrow. And so he'll have to let me know and if he's going to host. We'll do it at his house and uh, do it all again. Right. Talk about so what we're going to do, where we're headed, who's yeah. coming, and all that good stuff for new listeners and uh hopefully viewers yeah. cabin con is our annual get together with 
our gaming gaming bros. Yep. Uh, mostly the ones that are um, local to us here in Michigan. Um, yes. Does anybody come out of state anymore? Big D does from Ohio, um, but he he's missed the last couple, so I don't know if he's coming or not. Yeah. If he doesn't show this year again, I mean, yeah, we're gonna have nobody. It's gonna be all in staters. Right. So, so. yeah. So it's a, a long weekend: Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where we mm-hmm. just get together and play games. We we, we don't go very far, but no. it's a nice it's a nice set of cabins mm-hmm. out at what's the name of it again? Lake George Resort. Check it Lake, out if you're in Michigan. Lake George Resort. Um, it's uh, our can, con away from cap uh, from uh, our con away from Gen Con. Really. Yeah, it's not. Um, yeah, it's a different beast. Uh, yeah. And so we usually break out and play games. So I kind of tried to pick some just in general. This is what I think about. First is when you're thinking about making a game or creating a game for Cabin Con or any, or any other convention. Uh, you have to if you're going to a Gen Con type style where the game is set and they have two hour, four hour slots, whatever it is, you definitely have to consider your time constraints. Um, at Cabin Con, we have a little more freedom. Yeah. So when you're considering a game, if you're going to run a game, if you're going to run a game for four hours, Joe, mm-hmm. what do you think about? You say, okay, I got like you know, I want to fit this in a four hour window. So how does how does time affect your planning for the game? Well, you have to think about encounters. Yep. Especially if you're running uh, any combat, uh, a game more focused on combat, which most of them are. Yes. But um, if you're going to do a four hour slot, you're probably mm-hmm. not going to have more than four combat encounters. Probably. So not. probably more like three. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to have time for RP, maybe have a non combat encounter. It depends on what you're going to run. If right. you're going to run a combat intensive, session then uh you really have to you might still plan a couple extra Mm -hmm. um unless you're doing the whole railroad thing right where you're the conductor and they follow you or they don't and you don't have a game but the truth is would you say though that's a good point is there advantage to being a conductor in a con game oh yeah Yeah. i mean for both players and DMs. Yes. But the DM yes. conductor, it can be advantageous, right? Especially at uh, the, a slotted, a timed slot at mm-hmm. a large or even a smaller con, mm-hmm. not as, as important as at our more relaxed um, environment. But mm-hmm. if you pay for four hours, right. and then if someone pays for four hours to sit at your table, you need to give them four hours of game time. I agree. And you can't be worried about player agency that much as far as that goes. Well, I don't think I can. I think another thing to consider is, especially for the convention, I ran a few years at Gen Con. I ran back then the second edition days. Uh, never ran. I don't think I ever ran a third edition game. Did run Pathfinder. They were all four-hour slots. But you got to, at a big convention, you got to collect tickets. You got to pass out characters or role characters. We're going to do, we'll talk about that in a minute. So you got some, you got some, uh, housekeeping to do at the beginning and it used to be back when i went to gen con in the early 90s you had housekeeping at the end because they would a lot of games were like you'd vote to see who the best role player was and they'd get a little prize uh gen con would su- supply the prizes um uh another thing about time i know my first year there was a game that lasted 12 hours i saw it in the books there was a 12 wow. hour rpg and there were some that had that were tournaments so you would play four hours on thursday four hours on friday and uh, four hours on Thursday, if you made it to the second round, you play four hours on Friday. If you made it to the final round, you'd play four hours on Saturday. So we don't see that sort of thing too much in Cabin Con, where we tend to do four-hour slots. But I've been thinking, why do we do that? I mean, we don't. you don't have to, even though we, I know it's set up nicely. But we could just, nobody ever just run. we've said it before, yeah. nobody ever just runs a, I'm going to run an eight-hour game. Well, I think the couple of times it's happened, there's been, uh, some yammering about it because you know other people are wanting to get their game started and if their players are in the longer running games they're kind of screwed but um i think at cabin con we can yeah and i, I think we have run longer than four yeah. hour sessions I, I did not on purpose at least one year yeah and 
um, except for, like I said, a few, a little, you know, some talk, um, it's, it's gone over well. And, it and just I think takes, it, it takes some, you know, planning and adjusting. And, you know, yeah. since we're all buds, it, yeah. it's not a huge deal. It's just like, Oh, I was waiting forever. I think, I think though, it's become such a, such an expectation of four hours at cabin con that if you're, if I'm going to run a six hour game, I should, I, I wouldn't feel obligated to announce it. Oh, sure. Sure. Hey, if you sign up for this, in my morning game, we're not playing nine to one. We're playing nine to three. Right. So you're committed, you know, right. to play that. So don't, yeah. don't sign up if you don't want to be there for six hours. And I think the four hour slot thing is just from convention play in general. Yeah. But so. I feel like it's pretty good. I feel like four is kind of a magic number. It, to me, it does. I, hmm. I think, I think you're going to disagree with me. Go ahead. For convention play. Sure. But not in general. No, I meant for cabin con. For Cabin Con, oh yeah, and Gen Con, it works. It works fine at Cabin Con. You would not be opposed to longer games. Oh no, okay, not at all. Now, yeah. if you do longer games, that means you do fewer. There's no yeah. way around that. No, there's not. Especially at, yeah, in con, Gen Con, Cabin Con, any con, if you run a couple of long games, a couple of six or eight hour games, your convention's almost over. Now, <laughs> what do you think about this? We're talking about timed and all that. Mm -hmm on legion of myth he brought uh they they had a guest and he said the way they did things this is when it wasn't a con or anything like that mm -hmm. but they would they would uh start playing friday play saturday they might even start at thursday but definitely friday and saturday and su su sunday morning so starting friday afternoon evening going yeah. all the way through saturday like we used to do a long time ago oh yeah so you could run a campaign that way. Yeah. And they would, wow. they would play um, every month and a half. So every six weeks, let's say. So that's oh. why they went for the longer ones is they couldn't play every week. They didn't even play every month. That was their home game, though. That wasn't home a game. No, home game. But we could run a cabin con like that. Yeah. We just, and, and he said they had a lot of people. Really? So... Um, like you mean like double digits oh yeah wow. so so i think it's possible and you know back in the day we did run more people yeah. but it was six was six was low in back in the day yeah so i think we could run big a big a big crowd um and just i don't, I don't know i don't know if people would want to do that though yeah it's something to bring up it'd be something to bring up oh well, you know you know i'm going to write that down business meeting uh campaign style where it's like really a campaign we got a handful of folks i know wouldn't be interested but that doesn't mean six seven people couldn't go like dude I'd, would you be down to play thursday a module or a we're gonna play temple of elemental evil randy's gonna bring the he's got the return he's got the um goodman games one we're gonna jump right into hamlet and we're gonna run that on thursday and then friday we're going to the temple <laughs> I mean, would you be down with that and some people be like I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to spend your con doing that, do it. Um, but I think I'd need, if I'm going to run it, I would need uh, some commitment from people. Oh, sure. You know, that I'm not going to, they're not going to bail on me four hours in. Cause now to be fair, they can get bored and then it's my fault. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, if, if everybody was getting bored, I'd probably bail. Um, what about pre-gens or not? Oh, cons, you got to do pre-gens. I, I feel like you have to, um, unless you're running a, an RPGA style, or we've tried like I had a third. I have a thirteenth age game that I run at Cabin Con every year, and you guys are what going to be seventh level this year. Yeah, and so um, every level the players level up, and so it's campaign style, but it's still a four hour adventure. And after Cabin Con's over, if you play whether you play or not, if you play in a couple of my games, thirteenth age, you get a level. Next right. year will be eighth level. Yeah, um, but even that. Short of that, if you're not running a campaign style repeat thing, most of the time people say being pre-gens, though we did run Elysium and Pathfinder where you could, in a game like that, where you can say 15 point build, seventh level characters, standard goal, go. Yeah. And, and let players have it. But I think a lot of times pre-gens, if you're going to introduce a new game, I think pre-gens are a must. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
What do you think about, I know you're not a big fan of big backgrounds, but what about a game? If I'm going to tell it, if we're going to have a, con, I said we're going to have a contained four hour story. I mean, it's a one shot and I'm making pre-gens. How would you feel if the DM, because I've done this before, if I built in some motivations for your character? Yeah, a few sentences is one thing. Yeah, yeah not, fine. not or Or I used to do this too, connections between other characters. Yeah, that's so cool. You feel this way about this guy. You and this guy have done this. That could be that could be a good motivating thing. I think. I think that's not yeah. a bad idea. Given the now, it does give the the DM comes a little more author of your character, but that's okay. I think for a one shot. Um, would you like to roll your own when you sit down to do a one shot? Do you ever like that idea? It all depends. I mean, for a for a, for a con game, it would, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably better just to have something ready for for me. I'd rather just pick something up and go. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to spend part of the four hours making a, uh, a character, I guess the only exception to that would be if it's a brand new game yeah. and we're trying to feel out if we want to play it. Maybe roll up characters. Yeah, you know, making a part of uh, the game is character creation. Mm -hmm. So that might be worthwhile, especially if you're, if, well, if it's just a one shot. I guess I depends know. on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if what do you a, think about mm -hmm. a one shot con game? Give me characters, right? I think Prefer I'm, I'm, preferable. I'm with you there mainly. I, I try to do that. Yeah, what about crunchier rules? Light, I mean, depends on if I know it, right? That's what I thought too. Yeah, if, if, it's, if it's Pathfinder, I'm fine. If it's yeah. 3x, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, if it's riffs, I'm probably fine because I'll wing it. It's but similar it's, enough. Yeah, if it gets too far outside of my wheelhouse and it's a really complicated, crunchy game, like I don't know, say Shadowrun, which I played Shadowrun, I don't know if it was fourth or fifth edition once, and I just, the guy that ran it, I just could not. It wasn't that I was confused, I just didn't know what all the things on my character sheet meant, and he didn't explain things very well. We just started playing, and I could role play, and he would tell me, and I guess one thing you'd say, if you have the characters completed in a crunchy game, <clears throat> And the DM knows the rules well. So do you see where it says size modifier? Yeah, that's what you add to your damage right, or whatever. Right. No, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think both can work. But I think with Crunchy, I would definitely want a pre-gen. Um, rules light, I think it doesn't matter. Yeah. If it's uh, like an od and &D style rules light, you can, you can make a character in five minutes. Right. Even if you don't know the game. Right. An actual five, maybe 10 at the outside. Right. And then making a character is fine. Right. But I think mostly, uh, I think the crunchy and rules light, though, I don't think I have a, we're talking about rules, I don't think I have a preference in a con game. I mean, you know, I thought Aliens was relatively light in the rules, even though it's got a big, thick book. There's not much, comp there's not much complication in the rules, how they interact. Is it one of those where it's more complicated to make a character and then once you get into play, it's pretty simple? Actually, making characters in, in Aliens was pretty easy. Oh, okay. It's, it's all the way they interact, the roles you have to make, the D66 table. Mm. It's kind of weird. Once you master that, it's not it's not so bad. Um, yeah. Um, uh, for me, if I know the game or the DM or GM knows mm -hmm. the game mm -hmm. well, then mm -hmm. a complicated game still is fine. I've played a lot of different complex games. Yep. And I can handle just about any roll percentile here, roll this, that, there. These are your mm -hmm. powers. If, if if the overview doesn't take too long and the and the guy running the game knows what he's talking about, mm -hmm. I'm good. Yeah. Me either too. way, either way, rules light or rules heavy, it doesn't matter. Okay. What about uh, experienced players or noobs? What do you think the pros and cons are on that? If you have a table full of experienced players versus a table full of several noobs at a con mm -hmm. um i think at a con it depends on how noob you're talking if you're talking mm -hmm. about new to that game or new mm -hmm. to gaming in general right two different things yes. if it's new to gaming in general then um either the slot should be geared for that right. or um uh you should just make allowances as a player or and or dm well we've got a new guy here we're gonna go slow 
There's just all, that's all there is to it. And I don't know if they still do it, but I know when I was first going to Gen Con the first few years, they had different levels. This game is, they would have like, I think they had them numbered one, two, three. If it was a three, it was experience required. You played this game a lot. You know the rules. Two means you played it once or twice. You understand the idea. One is you've heard about it and never played it. And so some games were, some game slots, some GMs were like, I only want experienced players. And That's I've fine. seen I, and I only want noob players. Now, I don't, I don't, um, I think at Cabin Con, it's, it's, this is a moot point because we just play with our buddies. And right, we'll, right. We'll make allowances if someone's never played a game before and we'll give them pre gens and we'll go after it. Correct. Um, I think as a, if you have a bunch of noobs, though, I think you're a little bit responsible to teach the game. I mean, to really teach it. So, yes. And even, and if you have experienced players playing a brand new game, if we've never played, you know, Mothership which is a game I'm thinking about getting. It's getting ready to do a Kickstarter, um, which is like Aliens, but uh, I think even smaller in terms of thickness. So, um, you know, you got to teach the game too. And I've done that. Um, how about scenarios? So I think in a con game, especially if it's going to be a one-off, I think it's good to do very to do challenging or unique adventures. I mean, I think it's better to like, okay, our adventure is to kill the Terrask. That's super cool because right. you don't do that much in a campaign. No. And it's like, whoa, we're going to be some totally powerful characters. We're going to go fight the Terrask. Awesome. So write an adventure where the characters get to fight the Terrask or defeat it in some way. Um, okay. Okay. Yep. Wrinkle. Yes. The DM says you got to fight and kill the Terrask. Okay. You get there expecting. 20th level characters something like that and you end up with seventh level characters you're like what's the deal here and well, you've got to figure out the chink in the armor you find out right. figure out that and you can just bring them down otherwise right. yeah so what you might end up playing any uh so you would have it doesn't have to be the terrorist mm -hmm. it would have to be uber powerful what would normally be an uber powerful monster you would need high level characters in a D, &D type mm -hmm. setting to defeat right. or even have a chance of it yeah but you you give them to make it unique you can give them low level characters so they don't have a, a book to learn because yeah. you sit down at the table with a 20th level character you've never played before that's really challenging yeah but well, a yeah. better yeah. challenge i think would have low level characters and then you have to figure out the secret to bringing down the Terrasque as seventh level characters or something like that. Right. Then it's unique and challenging. Or you yeah. could have like, or, or do things that are less common. Like, you know, in your campaign, you might fight orcs and do all sorts of mundane stuff. Well, in this adventure, folks, you guys are breaking into the third layer of hell and you're stealing from the vault of Geryon, the arch devil of that. I think he's level five, actually, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Prince, arch, arch devil Geryon. You got to steal stuff. So, that would be a pretty unique scenario that could be fun, a high style game yes. where you're doing something really cool. And uh, I think that could be really, I think that that those kind of things to me kind of get my blood pumping when we're doing something cool like that. Right. Can it be fun to do the mundane though? We need to go guard the caravan. Well, it can be. Right. Now, um, at, but I, you know, if you're going to a con and you're paying for a slot, you mm -hmm. probably don't want to guard the caravan. If, if that's truly all it is, if right. it's built as guard guarding the caravan, and then it turns into something more interesting, right. then that's fine. Or, the caravan's got a dark wagon. All the windows are painted black and you can't see in it and you're transporting a vampire. Right. That would be cool. <laughs> yes. So the, another thing that yeah, maybe, maybe, the DM could say, you're guarding a caravan. It's up to you to make it interesting. Hit me with what you got, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. Okay. You could maybe do that, but then you might look at the players at the table and they're all going, huh? Well, <laughs> I think you advertise that if you're doing a big con. Yeah. Um, I would say players, like if, even at Cabin Con, if I'm going to do something like that, I'm going to say, I only want players that are willing to input in the story because yeah. I'm going to have a very loose plot. You guys are going to drive it. Yeah, Bill so is player ideas. driven. Player Here's the driven. Premise. Here's the and I would tell you in advance. The premise is you're guarding a caravan. Think about what could make this interesting. Yeah. You know. Um, what about PvP? 
I think that could be a unique thing in a one shot. I mean, we did it with. Yeah, we've done that a lot. Yeah, I, I think that's not where you have a. We talk about the plant, right? Our yeah. buddy, uh, not Greg D, but uh, Greg T. <laughs> he got tagged as the plant a couple of times. Yeah. And so, yeah, that makes the game as a one off. It's not so bad. So if your your one shot wizard gets backstabbed by the rogue and killed, yeah, it sucks. But yeah. Story's over. It was cool. That's all yeah, right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I think uh, from our point of view, the cabin Connors, we might have a unique, somewhat unique point of view on PVP, wherein we would say, yeah, we've done a lot of that. It's not really unique anymore. Um, no. I'd rather do something else. Yeah, it's we actually created a cabin con campaign, Elysium, we've talked about that started out as just arena battles between characters. Yeah. So they didn't truly die. No. So you could bring the character back again. Right. So it was more, I think it was, it ended up becoming more a test of the system and yes. test test of a player's adeptness at the system yep. than anything else. Yeah. How good are you at the build game? Yeah. And, and, and at, and at strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no, nothing more terrifying to fight than a fellow player character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about managing the table at a con? I think that's important. You got to keep the pace, keep it exciting. It doesn't have to be, you know, you know, a frenzy of excitement, but you got to have some highs and lows. Um, I think with the number of players, you got to manage the table. You got to yeah. be, make sure everybody can do what they do. You know, I would cat, you know, I can't, I have forever have capped myself the last few years at four or five players. I find when I play old school, six is fine. I'm comfortable with six. I've been doing that with the play test with mud sword. I kind of like it because I know it's lethal at low levels. I may want to change that at high levels. Who know? Who knows? Um, but do you think are any of these things ever an issue that you can see from you've never been to a convention, right? An actual convention on no. the cabinet. But yep. Yeah. That's that being said, um, I can see for a convention for people who are paying for their seat mm -hmm. now in general i don't think it's the job of the dm to entertain right necessarily so if right. you take that on that's cool mm -hmm. um but for the expectation is that i'm just going to sit here and you're going to entertain me no. no but uh when you pay for a seat at a table there's probably yeah. a higher expectation that the DM is supposed to provide a particular kind of experience and um, having those things, spotlight time, having a, having a good pace, having yeah. some kind of, um, inter it doesn't necessarily have to be unique because what's unique these days, right. but, but definitely something engaging and interesting um, and having a good pace because you only have four hours. Yeah. You have to be able to, wrangle those characters down your path if right. they're not willing to just go i'm i'm pretty easy on bait so you can easily bait me down a path you look for the bait because you also yeah want i to want to because at cabin con you goes i want to play this dang story let's look for it a little bit i mean you know and it's okay if, if a player kind of gets a little like you know makes me work for it they're not just gonna they're just not gonna bite immediately but i think I'm, you know, i'll give you i'll, I'll say I'm going to buy the bait and I'll mm -hmm. put it in my mouth. Here's some string. Right. Yank me right. down the path. I right. mean, uh, I'll invent bait. I'll, uh, yeah, this guy, I'm going to talk to this guy or whatever. Right. It's, uh, but, um, but you have to be careful if, at least for us, I mean, if the players can get off on like a tangent at the spaceport and they start talking about getting to role play, they're into it. They're talking with the, with the, with the cute little uh, waitress and then they end up talking with each other and they're role playing, role play. And you've done this for 25 minutes and be like, dude, we've only got less than three hours left. We got to get to this. And you're like, oh crap. You know, so you got to be careful. We've had times where, you know, when that fails, and this is something I've, I've learned only in recent years to narrate the end sometimes or narrate a portion i've had to narrate through a scene which i it feels a little it feels empty when i have to do that so okay you go in the room and you fight this lich and you run him off but you don't kill him now you come to the portal you know and i do that because i'm like oh crap look at my watch i'm like oh you gotta get to your next game right. and that's that that makes you feel bad as a dm when you've not planned that accordingly right and then you yeah. also 
what you want to make sure is I had something in my head and now it's gone. <laughs> you don't want to do this. Your four characters walk into a bar. What do you do? Not at a con, not at a con. Oh, you don't, don't do that. So. No, you, you really don't do that at your home ta table either all that much. No, but uh, you have to give a little more than that at home, but at a con, you can't do that. Yeah, in, in the play test for Mud Sword, I'm kind of, I'm doing a little more like starting you off with the hook. And I got the guy that sends you on the adventure initially, mm -hmm. just because we want to get to the game. But in general, I wouldn't be inclined to say, what do you do? But I would throw some things at different people, and I would just see what you would bite on. You know, I wouldn't necessarily make it, here's the quest giver, you know. This would be something more like what you would do at a con with that intro. Instead yeah. of, you walk into a tavern, tavern, what do you do? No, yeah. you say all four of you wake up naked in a in a four by four concrete cell. What do you do? Yeah, that's a, yeah. And I, I've actually played that scenario at Gen Con. I had a great time. It ended up being very complex, but yeah, that's a, that's more like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the next one. How about killing PCs? Is that a no no? Is it appropriate? Well, it's sure. sure, sure. Okay. At a con with the caveat that perhaps the, a caveat, I don't even know. It's just occurred to me. You say at the beginning, death is on the table. Yep. And if, there's pre, and if you're using pre-gens, it shouldn't be an issue. If no. they're bringing their character, I don't know why they would, but it's possible, I guess. Maybe RPGA, it's a maybe, society. maybe something like that. But if, if you're providing pregens, death, yeah, obviously. I've not GM'd much of Pathfinder Society. I did in year zero and year one a little bit. But it seemed like their encounters were built to be defeated by halfway proficient players. Mm -hmm. And you needed some really bad luck to die, even at low levels. Um, you could make an argument. I paid four bucks. My character died in the first scene. That would, that would suck in old school if you're running a first level adventure in old school that could happen you know yes. without even trying too hard so i think but i would think players that sit down to play first edition ad and d first level characters realize i need to be careful about when i engage in combat right so right know. but anytime you've got random chance so you can roll natural 20 max that back and max on the damage dice and you know, some, some monsters, they do, they pull a crit, just an off chance, pull a crit. You're dead. There's not really yeah. anything you can do about it. But you know, you fix that and I've done it too, by having extra. Extra care. Yeah. Dude, have extra care. Like, look, okay. Dude's dead. In comes our old friend, Tom. Hey, where you been, man? Hey, help us fight this stupid orc. <laughs> There's a cage behind the orc that, yeah. and you know, you get that guy out of there. He can help you out. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I say the best for last safety tools <laughs> everyone knows we love them okay so if we were in the same room right now <laughs> even just bringing up safety tools makes the environment unsafe for randy <laughs> yeah no doubt dude um, okay at a con though maybe that's the place you're going to use them or yeah. on anytime you're dealing with strangers safety tools are kind of a you know, you have to think about them. I but, would say it would only be, I would only do it. God, I, I would probably only do it if I'm going to run something that's going to be a little, in my mind, a little bit either risque or maybe something really dark. Um, your characters are going to make a deal with the devil. And you're going to have so much time limit before you die and go to hell. And if people want to face, deal with that sort of difficult thing, I would warn them up front. Some supernatural horror is about to happen. So if I, if I ran a con game mm -hmm. and um, someone at the table, I probably wouldn't advertise safety tools. I probably wouldn't mention them in any documentation, mm -hmm. online documentation or anything people would read before signing up. But if yeah. once people are at the table and they ask, what about safety tools? I'd say, hey, you know, if something comes up and you feel the need to stop play 
because you're offended or because it's something you can't deal with and we, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, here's your $4 and we'll, we'll call it good. Or yeah. um, you can feel free to leave. Right. Um, I'm not going to bring up stuff that anybody unless they're really It'd looking be pretty, to be offended a pretty heavy corner case for someone to be offended at my table right because there's not going to be any sexual situations it's always going to no. be fade to black if it even is it even going to be if a it thing. even exists so the only way that um when i run a game someone is going to get offended is if they get offended at orcs being the bad guys if right. they're in the game or some other what some people might call too tropey, uh, whatever. You know. Look, and there is no safety tool that will protect you against my evil orcs. Right. The only safety tool is getting up and walking away. Right, right. And I think so, that's a good, yeah. Yeah. And so, have a kind of non-issue. We don't even talk about it. Right. No, it's not. Right. So we know each other really well. If we have a heartburn about something, we say it yep. or don't and bite, bite our lip. Yep. It's not. I mean, I'm sure there's people who maybe wanted to say something. Maybe they didn't. Probably. Yep. But we don't we don't lose friendships over oh. small small potatoes that happen at a game. Yep. Yep. All right. That's that's all I'd come up with. You got any other ideas for con games you thought I things I might have missed? Um I don't think so. Um if I miss something our fellow con cabin con guys want to talk about, please call in or in an email or if anybody out there has ideas of things that we may have skipped over for your experience in con play um yeah just give us a holler so yeah i think the i think the most important thing about running and we and i think we took we mentioned it running mm -hmm. a a con game i think is for it to be unique maybe but definitely interesting and fun and engaging yeah um, you need to Whenever make I sure. Me, I, I would even say something that you don't get to do very often. The terrasque, you don't get a very off, big opportunity to fight the terrasque yeah. in whatever form you do it. You don't get a big opportunity necessarily to sneak into an archdevil's secret vault. Right. I mean, that doesn't usually happen in a campaign. Right. Or, you know, how cool would this be? I and mean, this would be so, this would blow Joe's mind if I did this. Your second level characters, and you each have six magic items to start the game with. And I mean, good magic items, not potions, permanent magic items. Oh. I mean, you'd be like, what? Let's and, do that. Let's see. Yeah. I know. It'd be kind of cool. I, I, I may do that. That's a cool idea. Yeah, but what you don't know is I'm going to throw an ogre mage at you. <laughs> yes, because he wants your magic items. There's a second level party, and they've got six, they got 12, six times six, 36 magic items. You guys would be in so, so much trouble. Target. <laughs> that, we would be if that got targets. out, you would be targets, man. A bunch of bandits come in still you blind. Yeah. One of the magic items is going to have to be a bag of holding. We're going to put all but one of them in there. <laughs> Whenever we go anywhere. We right. go into town, put your stuff in the bag. I got a plus three sword. Take any dude. chances. You are a second level thief. I don't care if you have a plus three dagger. Put that thing in there. You yeah. don't want someone to take that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All right. All right. Yes. Shall we move on? Yes, we shall. And it was hey. my idea to move on because yes, I'm in charge today. My bad. I didn't even think of moving on. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm stepping all over Joe's toes. He's getting he's getting prickly about this. Yes, I'm raising my eyebrow. Anyway, like it, love it, or leave it. I will. We're going to learn you some things about us today. Yeah, baby. So I'll go ahead. Soft drinks. I love them. <laughs> but that's bad. Yes. They're not good for me. I like diet. I like non-diet. I like fizzy drinks. Yeah. Weak weakness is soda. Yeah. No doubt. Uh, yeah. I know that. I like, one. It. I like it way too much. But it's funny. I'm not a Mountain Dew guy. I like the dark soda. I believe Joe likes them. You, you're more of the light soda guy. You like yeah, them. I don't like dark right? colas. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they have a very, I don't like them. Yeah. I like Pepsi and Coke and crap like that. Yeah. You're a weirdo. I am. Um, philosophy. I, oh, love it. I love it. I think 
at times you can go down a rabbit hole where it gets a little weirdo stuff. But generally speaking, I mean, mathematics is an offshoot of philosophy. It's a type of logic, you know, logic based philosophy and, and symbolic, lo symbolic logic is a, you know, kind of a, a, pre a, a precursor precursor to mathematics mm -hmm. but philosophy is in many ways the king of the sciences yeah well philosophers have been trying to answer the question of are we real or are we figments of our own imagination for okay. thousands of years and have not been able to formulate as far as i know any mm -hmm. truly unassailable you are real you are you are real because of, except right. I think for me, the closest has the, the anyone has ever come isn't really a proof, but I think it's good enough. And yeah. it's, and it's, I said, I can't remember if it's Hegel. Mm -hmm. I think therefore I am. And that's not uh, what we thought, what I used to think of it, what it, what meant before I learned what it actually meant. Yeah. I used to think that it meant because I, I have imagined myself into existence. Everything exists because I'm imagining it. And that's not what that means. No. It just means I'm a the thinking fact being. that I'm thinking proves mm -hmm. that I exist. Right. But do dogs think? I guess they do. But they also exist. True. But the fact that I'm thinking pretty much negates the whole, all this thousands of years of well, we are a real because of this and that and the other thing, esoteric stuff. No, you're questioning, you're thinking you are real. Just yeah. Oh, and, and the debate of is there a God eventually comes to a person's philosophy on things. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a tough, yeah, I, I like it. It, 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 it really shapes our, our world. I mean, everybody's worldview is basically on some sort of philosophy, whether you know it or not. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's important. And, and, I, and I really love it. Yeah. Now, it's possible that I have that wrong on some level, what yeah. I just said. Sounded if good. So, if so, let me know. But that's what I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure of that. Don't but, tell me. I, I, I would never want to know that Joe could ever be wrong. So yeah. that would hurt me badly. I know. Okay. We'll keep it a secret. Anyway, dice. Dice, dude. Huh. Let me see. I wonder what I think about dice. I think I like them. Maybe, I'm but you keep them imprisoned in that spherical glass they are, thing. They are precious to me. <laughs> um, got, yeah, uh, went to a comic con with my buddy Jeff this past weekend. And one day he bought a D100 a little bigger than this dude. And it was a weapon, a metal D100. And it rolled pretty well. A metal D100 that big? Oh, dude. It's a straight-up weapon. But, yes, I do like me some dice. I'm slowing down the collection part, though. I'm starting to look. I like metals. So I'm mainly only buying metals every once in a while. They got to blow me away. So, but yes. Yeah, because they're wicked expensive. They are. The metals are, yeah. I've paid, I haven't bought any. I've paid in the neighborhood of 30-ish bucks for a set of metals. And that's not the high end. No, that, no. Uh, that's kind of the beginning. So, but I do like my, I do like my dice. Yeah. I would say strong light to almost love. Okay. But you buddy, how about camping? How do you feel about camping? I wish I could go. I like it. And I wish I could go more often to uh, know whether I love it or not. When was the last time you went camping and did you, did you rough it or did you stay in a cabin? It's been a long time. Cabin Con is technically, town. is Cabin Con considered camping? The closest Cabin Con has ever been, we could ever consider Cabin Con camping was the first one. Because Correct. It, only because the cabins had mud floors. <laughs> yeah, they did, dude. That was pretty cool. The walls, yeah. the walls and ceiling were, were made of wood-like material. Yes. <laughs> Was it pressed board or was it or actual wood? I can't remember. I think it was wood. The beds weren't impressive either. No, no, no. <laughs> they were definitely rough. So you say you think you like camping, but you need to explore more to be sure if you loved it. No, right. So like for sure, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to do more to determine whether I love it. Me too. I haven't camped since I was young yeah. and I never camped in a tent. I only camped 
in a sleeping bag, we'd find trees and sleep under them. Mm -hmm. So that was still pretty fun. Um, this is a pretty broad one. Art. Art. Oh, yeah. Art's great. Yeah. Uh, I don't like modern art. I think most no. modern art's crap. Right. But uh, I definitely love art. Okay. Well done. Art. Weekly RPG campaigns. Love. <laughs> you would love a week every Friday, six o'clock uh, at midnight. That goes without saying. <laughs> well, you just said it. <laughs> well, I had to because you asked me, but I mean, I know. really. So let's do it, man. What are we screwing around for? Uh, we have lives. Screw lives. D and D is our life. Yes. It's a community. <laughs> it's community. Be a part of it. Community. <laughs> Okay, cool. Oh, community. All right. So are we done with that? Yeah. Ready to move on? Move us on, sir. All right. We're going to play in the mud. Yes. Meet in the mud. Yeah. So we're going to discuss our mud sword code, our, our, our project code named mud sword. Which we didn't play last Saturday like we promised. Somebody got sick on this podcast. Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got a little phlegmy and coughing a lot, and so did my wife. So we figured it might be, a, you know, the greater part of valor to stay home and make sure we didn't spread any germs around. Yeah, just in case. Just yeah, in yeah. case. Yeah, good. It was it was cool. We still had four people over. We had a, good, I had a big long visit. We just talked our butts off. But my plan was, and it is the next time we play, I'm going to be. Uh, work, I'm working on turning. I don't know if you noticed. You probably have in the most recent. The update i've sent to you joe that turning undead i have a chart for mm -hmm. and saving throws um i'm gonna we have we're currently using a single saving throw as a number a la swords and wizardry mm -hmm. and we modify it based upon your race your class they give you some bonus bonus different situations different situations and i'm using roughly i'm trying to marry a, an idea that joe loves he loved in third edition and Correct me if I'm wrong. You love reflex, will, and fortitude. Yeah. And I think I agree. It's a good, very solid three saving throws, kind of covers the gamut. Um, currently, I'm enamored of a single make the saving throw, something about that I like. So I'm trying to marry a single number where if you have a bonus to reflex saves, you would add it to your target number. And I'm kind of going old school. So, like, I think your second level wizard has a 16. Is that the wizard saving throw? Do you remember? It's either 16 or 17. Yeah, it's oh, pretty hard. No, I think it went to 16. Yeah. Did it go to 16? Yeah, and it no. gets better once every five levels. Yeah, so it didn't because it hasn't reached fifth level. Right, so it's 17. And I'm currently, and I think I'm going to have to change this. I want to play test it. Uh, and the scenario I had ready had you probably making multiple saving throws, which I know mathematically people are in trouble. And I think... Joe had talked to me, you talked to me before about you think I need to add the appropriate ability score modifier to the save. And I think you're right. I think that you're going to need that help. Um, fighters get a bonus to fortitude. I think dwarves get a bonus to sort of a fortitude save. I think you could, if you had a high constitution, you get a bonus to fortitude. If I add that in, um, I got a feeling I'm going to find that out. But right now, I still lean toward just playing it as it is and see what happens. Well, it um, was an option in Beckme, or at least in at least in the rule cyclopedia to add stats. What? It was really yeah. oh okay. Um, we also Joe and I Joe took a, a lion's share of the project, and he. He did his uh, spell description for magic users. You want to talk about your, did you have a philosophy, a design philosophy as you were working on the, you, he, he rewrote the first level spells from Beckme, or at least the rule cyclopedia in a format that he quote unquote liked. What, what was your, well, uh, essentially, um, yeah, okay. None of them are functionally different. Right. So um, the rewrites are ma mainly to reduce redundant language, mm -hmm. um, correct grammar, uh, not so much spelling, but there's some grammar issues and some redundant right. language. Um, right. So um, some, there are some spells where the duration is mentioned as a line. Um, so you have the, like the name of the spell, its level, and um, duration, maybe targets and stuff like that as one line. 
uh, as uh, lines above the description. And then you have the uh, paragraph or so of description. Yeah. So some, some spells will mention things that are in those lines above, like it, it, it can do this many targets where it's, you've already mentioned it up there. So you don't need it in the description. So um, I've taken, I, I would just went through them and, you know, just, I think had better language. Oh, I think so too. And I appreciate you getting to, to me early. You actually inspired me a little bit. Were you surprised that there weren't that many first level manager spells? Yeah, there's not that many. And I, I, I like that as a base game. Yeah, me having, too. Having uh, a small set of base spells that you could consider like rote or common, it's at least within the sphere of magic users. I mean, not common that everybody uses them, but common magic. And then if you want to add other things, those could be unique or those could be, you know, brought in at a later time in the game, any something D &D like that. Or any any D, D type spell you could borrow from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really like that. You know, when I did, the, and I did a similar for the list for the clerics, but I'm taking a different tact. Um, I don't know if you, I don't know if you read my cleric descriptions for their, they're called miracles. And we're using a spell point system for clerics, but we're using a, Vancian system for wizards at low levels. And so clerics get their wisdom modifier plus their level in quote unquote miracle points. And what I did was, and I don't know if you read it or not, Joe, not I tried yet. not, I tried not to fully mimic like light is different for a cleric than it is for a wizard. For a wizard, it's light and they can turn it into darkness. I may have given them the darkness option, but I want to take it away. I called it holy light. And if you notice, it's a little more buff than a regular light spell. It lets them do some stuff to evil creatures. But my idea is, I don't think right now I envision clerics getting spells past fifth level. And they're miracles. Not character so level. Right. Fifth, fifth level, level spell spells. level. Yeah. They're gonna be fifth level miracles. Because my idea is the cleric is going to be a quasi holy templar, almost paladin type. I'm, I'm calling them right now the lawgivers in my campaign. So they all worship Lohas. So a cleric is not generic in, in our world. It's at least right now, he is a follower of Lohas. And um, so what I'm going to do is I want their miracles. They're going to, they're going to feel like things they can just call down from the, they don't memorize things. So clerics feel powerful. They can call any miracle they want based upon their spell points, their miracle points. Um, and I had several spells that I kind of changed things around. I'm thinking I'm not going to let them reverse. I have them reversing cure light wounds. And I think I'm going to take that away. I don't think I'm going to let them do that. Um, I think I'm going to make them more specific, more narrow. But in that narrow band of what they can do, I'm going to give them a few little tweaks. Like holy light, if you read it, it's pretty good. It can do stuff to demons and devils and undead. They got to make a special saving throw, or they can't enter the area of effect. Well, clerics so, in, in this uh, game don't get miracles or spells at first level, right? Correct. Correct. So you have to wait till second level, mm -hmm. and then it's fine. You, um, it's not light; it's holy light. So you have a correct. different name for it. If you I'm were perfect. going to just say for clerics, have the light spell, but it works differently, I would say probably need to change the name. It would be better. Right. And be I bad. also, and they have a few spells currently that they do share with wizards, but a lot of them I didn't like. The ones they shared, I tossed. I want them to be different. I want wizards to be the kings of versatility and overall spell power. I want them to be the ultimate in arcane casters. I want the cleric to be a guy who can call in divine might from time to time to do some things. I really think initially, like in second level, think about it. If you got a plus two, to your wisdom modifier and your second level, that's four miracle points. And every first level miracle costs you one. So you're they're jumping two, four spells a day, hmm. which is pretty powerful. So I may have to play around with that, but I'm yeah. going to try it right now. I'm going to try it right now. I'm hoping I can make it such a narrow band of abilities that you as the click wizard won't feel like crap. The clerk's a better caster than me because he could be initially, right? And maybe we fix it by cutting the points down, or maybe we fix it by giving wizards maybe a bonus based on intelligence in terms of what they can memorize. I don't know yet. So that's where I'm working at. I'm, it's going to be a huge leap from first to second level for a cleric, as I have it written right now. They're going to go from nothing to like, I mean, think about it. And if you have wisdom, probably plus two, you're looking at 
four power not miracle points. That's four spells. Whereas your wizard's casting what two? At second level, yeah. Yeah, two, spells, so gonna, two first level spells. Yeah, and granted, he can't do he can't sleep people, he can't magic missile people. You know, you'll still be you'll be doing damage. He's not doing much damage. Okay. Right? He can yeah, heal people. That might be all right. It might be. I mean, if you we'll look, have to, we'll have to play it. We're gonna have to see. And um, yeah. So I, I don't see them. And I, I can't remember my chart. I wish I had it handy. I don't have it with me. I'm not sure if they gain spells. I, I know the turn undead table. If you look, I made it pretty hard. Oh. Oh yeah. Not uh, the not the near cake walk that uh, typical D and D has. No, no, no. Uh, it starts at eleven instead of most of them starts at single digits for a skeleton. I made it eleven, and it doesn't progress like theirs. For many levels, it stays the same, and it jumps up. And I use a pattern of basically at the higher fifteenth level, I believe it goes. You got to roll a five and a seven. Even at fifteenth level, you don't have any automatic makes. Ah. So I'm making that because I'm thinking 36 level, you got to roll because I want turn and dead to be good, but I don't want it to be, you know, I want much. a little more. Yeah. I don't want it encounter ending. Yeah. Automatically time. turn vampires at second level. Yeah. Know, what is it? Seventh or eighth that they can. Yeah, seventh or eighth level, you're turning vampires with like a six or seven yeah. or nine, maybe. That's kind of ridiculous. And what that would mean almost, that would almost ensure that a crafty DM would throw more than one vampire in there. And then vampires drain two levels a hit. And if you right. have three or four vampires in there, you're going to just, dec- so what you turned one of them. Yeah. John Allen large had a recently had an episode on level yeah. draining. Yeah. I, I'm with him. I kind of yeah. like the idea of draining con. Yeah. And I like it coming back unless you go to zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like that. That's yeah. probably a better way to do it than levels. Yeah. You got to do a whole lot of adjusting with, levels yeah. with con you just got to adjust your hit points and i yeah. think it probably it would probably be good to just do the level con drain the con drain yes. not yes. damage as well probably just con. Oh, right probably you're so. taking damage you are taking damage yeah. yeah the only time you wouldn't be was when you're between nine and 12 yeah or nine and 11 if you're at 11 with the way because we're doing the third edition modifier so between 11 and nine you could take a couple of hits and not lose anything other than oh crap and i like how john says i think you get a point back a day something like d, that or d3 so it's like oh my god i have a 16 con but now i have a seven and i'm gonna have this for you know crap six days or seven days you know unless you can find restoration somehow if that's even which is gonna be a miracle of some sort yeah i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna have that be a thing right so um yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes and, and yeah. you know we, we may find the clerics a little bit too buff but i'm uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. But that's all that I really had thought about for this one. So I don't know if you had other comments about things on turning undead or anything with, with, with uh, where are you at on playing in the mud? Have you been doing any more dabbling? Or are you waiting for the next um, play? To- no, it's mostly in my head about factions within the, within yeah. a fictional, within a, a fantasy, the fantasy world. Uh, uh, but up. I do have a question. Yes. Do we want to, post any of our revisions online as like a blog post or do you want to keep um, it under wraps for now i think i think i want to do it relatively soon uh but the the play test document i'd like to play play test version two first mm-hmm. we only really have what we really have that we could put out there is pc creation rules right. and then of course spells and for first level first second level characters we have nothing but first level spells done but yeah we could absolutely put those out there and let people see it and see what they think i hope to have a full i would love to have a full-blown pdf i wish it would i could say at christmas that won't happen mm-hmm. um but by next year maybe the summer i'd like to have a pdf we could post for folks to look at and see what they think it wouldn't be a full-blown game it'd be basically rules on spells and magic and playing characters joe did uh he doodled a little druid up for us we didn't have the druid and we got i think that needs some more massaging right before I'll probably put it does I, I like the idea of it, especially the shape changing fighter okay anything else on the mud let's look. i don't think so all right cool hey i think it's contest time isn't it yes let's we do, that. do that before we, before we bug out yeah yes okay got my faithful d14 14 uh, we have 13 Okay. People? Yeah. 
You give me the high sign, baby, and I'll roll this bad boy. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, D14, I'm going to subtract one. If I get a one, I will re-roll. Here we go. And the winner is number three. Number three. Let's see what number three is. One, two, C, three. Hockey Puck Jr. <laughs> I know who that is. Yes. All right. Hockey Puck Jr. All right, Hockey Puck. Give us a contact. That's gonna be that's gonna be some uh cheap mailage posting. So just just uh FYI, yep. had FF Warmy confirmed <sighs> it would have been ff wormy dude come on wormy so i'm getting to the point where i think ff wormy since they have, still have not con confirmed their email mm -hmm. that it might have been a bot or something like that however if you want to uh make sure that if you're ff wormy and you're listening to this and you're yeah. like no i'm real i'm real um confirm uh, it may I may have to resend the confirmation, mm -hmm. so I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to okay, I can do that right here because he hadn't done that last time either. He would have he had a chance to win something. I think he was in the in the running. Yes. Okay. He was in the running, but he didn't roll him. It's just we didn't yeah. concede. Well, he's not in. He's not. He or she is not in the running because he is not confirmed. If he had been there, I would not have to have done the very difficult mathematics of subtracting one. As we talked about last time, subtracting is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I could have just rolled my D14, which would have been sweet. Yeah. Dang it. Wormy. Dude. All right. So we're looking at 100 people next time for the next giveaway. The next giveaway is Contest at 100. Okay. Uh, I'm going to verify that we are still at six. We, well, okay. I'm going to refresh. Yes, we are 67. at 67. All right. Uh, last week, we had 48. Oh, so okay. It's almost a 20 subscriber bump. Sweet. So thank you to all of the new subscribers yeah. who are watching or listening. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks to Jason and John Allen for their call-ins. Yes. And that to was cool. Josh, um, Silent Sorry, Josh. Josh. <laughs> for sending us the news item of right. sixth sixth edition or 5.5 .5 or revised or whatever it's going to be yes the version of dnd &D we're not buying so yes yes most uh, unless somebody takes between now and the time it comes out they take it in the the direction of dnd &D back to actual dnd &D and away from representation dnd &D. yeah yeah agreed it's not going to happen, though. That's all right. That's all right. We got our game. Mud Sword's coming along, yeah, dude. Yeah. That's the next big craze. It will be. Yeah. Guaranteed. Mud Sword. Are we ready to head on out, then? We are, man. Yeah, let's all do right. it. Take us home, Big Daddy. All right. Well, if you'd like to support our show, please help us get the word out. Tell your friends, family members, and your enemies. Yeah. Especially your enemies. Yes. To check out our show, our website at biggestgeekestpodcast.com and if you'd like to support us there are ways to do that there at the support tab mm -hmm. um, check us out on odyssey and youtube as well um, i'm a little behind on on uh i've gotten our latest episode not counting today um mm -hmm. out on odyssey but i've got a kind of a gap there i gotta fill so yeah. so we can have most of our stuff out there so right. odyssey and youtube um um subscribe like do all the stuff that you normally do rate us uh, on i on itunes if you're listening to us there or apple podcasts whatever it's called now um i don't know why you're you you're even doing apple itunes because they suck i do apple itunes yeah well i'm sucky is what he's saying yes yes okay whatever podcast you're listening to give us a thumbs up or like or whatever if that's what you feel like you should do um if you need to email us the email address is the geeks at biggestgeekspodcast.com any questions or comments at all yep um we have we're going to have a uh, several links 
in our show notes. Please check that stuff out. We like it. You should too. Yeah. Yes. If you don't, you suck. <laughs> like his partner. <laughs> yes. And right. with that, if there is nothing else, this is Joe. And I'm Randy. And remember, if you can't be big like us, then be geeks like us.